Yeah, welcome to welcome no. to Platinum. <laughs> Matt is the worst <laughs> countdown just, artist in the it's world. It's just not good. It, no, it's just it's, not good. see, now you're here in person, you can yeah. actually see. Yeah. All right, welcome mean? everybody to Plaid Chat, episode 88, presented by T-Mobile. I can't believe we've done 88 episodes. That feels like a huge amount. Yeah. What the, I mean, I think real. by the I'm end of the season, we'll we've, be been, a... we've been able to stay friends, or at least, you know, uh, co-workers through all of this. Yeah. We lost one. I mean, along well, the we way. lost Bren, yeah, but <laughs> God we, bless. Bless. God we did lose one. That's true, but but you know, Vass is all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm all right. We I brought do. this guy on. He's an expert esports consultant, That's apparently. Yeah. yeah, he knows yep. about all the esports, of which Overwatch League professes to be one. So, and we signed all those Vass. players to Dallas. <laughs> he did. Yeah. yeah, you were in charge of the Dallas Fuel signings, I was. right? Actually, every day Stro would enter my office. I'd have a pair of Newton balls on the desk, so I'd be like click clacking. Yeah, and he'd come in and be like, "So, what's on your?" brilliant mind today and you're like hmm i'd like to sign mickey for another three years no for, that was his backup idea actually <laughs> my backup idea my first idea was to get Elma mystic so. oh right okay. and i said mm -hmm. and then also i dem i want two million dollars salary okay and they said you're fired <laughs> <laughs> hey, and then they you know what though pine with the money that they were paying you yeah look at the positives of not being there you get to sit here with us for free <laughs> That's yeah. actually, I haven't thought about doing free labor as a positive before. <laughs> I haven't thought about that one. That's pretty good, though. Yeah. All right. I mean, this, this was a run. nutty win. You, you, by the way, I've got a bone to pick with you, Mr. Huh? Matthew Morello. You didn't tell us anything about what was the big reveal. And I feel, I feel personally hurt. You just, just were teasing us the entire week. And then you went absent for the last week's episode as yeah. the, this big stream was dropped with a bunch of juicy information along with the biggest change. I didn't even tell you. I, didn't, I don't even think I told you guys I was hosting it. No, <laughs> I don't you, just, you said you were just involved on in the somewhere. stream. Yeah, I just appeared on the stream. Are yeah, you no, upset fun. with your friend because he followed an NDA? Yeah. Very, very yeah, I'm pissed. Yeah. Yeah. Here yeah. at Plat Chat, there's a long standing tradition of leaking <laughs> secrets. There's a long standing tradition on this show. So I'm just. Yeah, and Matt's so flouting it. He's flying in, Even the so in the face. Yeah. And well, it's, it's actually super funny because sometimes we'll have conversations on this show and like. I kind of have an idea of like what, what's actually going to happen with this conversation. And I just sit here and I'm like, and these guys are dumb. <laughs> like no, like these these people. I do that. Well, outside of you, Vass, we like you, especially That's because good. you're free. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Uh, but, I know. That's uh, a positive. But the me. other two, I don't even know. I, I so mean, you, Matt is kind of smart because he takes everyone else's knowledge that like he, he talks to, and then he compiles that okay. and puts it into his brain. But when it comes to original thought. You'd be hard pressed to find something valuable from Matt Morello. So, <laughs> depends on what you're after. Very true. Very true. I uh, I take stuff from you know uh, Josh, Bren, Avast, mm -hmm. uh, streamers, mm -hmm. and okay, then okay. when I hear a take from Johnny, I'm like, okay, this is the wrong take. This is <laughs> this is this is what I don't want to say. And let's try and formulate something the opposite of that. Are you saying you don't like five v five? No, I actually pitched five v five on the show. I couldn't find the episode. And uh, mm. to be honest, I didn't really look that hard. Somebody tweeted me about it. I asked them if they could find it, and then they never, they never uh, found it. And I, I looked back a bit, but I couldn't find it. Oh yeah, for anyone who has literally been living under a rock, the <laughs> live stream recently announced five v five. So Aaron Keller was on. Listen, don't worry, Kurt. I'm on top of it. Aaron, Aaron Keller he comes on the show. He says, "Okay, the game. It's gonna have some changes." I know a lot of you have been, you know, been concerned about the direction of Overwatch moving forwards, but we're making one vital change, and I've got to tell you right now. Big emotional speech at the beginning of it. And as he uttered the words, off-tank mains across the world uttered, <laughs> as the life left their what? body, their souls <laughs> were ripped out of their throats, and they said, if I can't trust Overwatch, who can I trust? And you know what I say to you, off-tank mains of the world? Do you know who's never going to let you down? You know who's never going to give you up? You know who's never going to desert you? That's right. It's T-Mobile, baby! Ooh. America's largest and fastest 5G network. They'll get you through anything. You having a rough time? T-Mobile. They want to connect you to, to the rest of your world. Let me get up the read because I've bloody forgotten it again and I didn't pull it up. <laughs> but, they help but, us connect in the digital world. Like, that's the only way we know of Ast. That true, yeah. I I'm 
This is my first time ever it's seeing so, Avast yeah. in, the, in the real world. Yeah, that's yeah. fair, right, yeah. But he got there through T-Mobile. You yeah, guys he isn't even, and... he is not even oh. corporeal. I can put my hand right through I'm him. I'm a like, hologram, like right that Michael yeah. Jackson show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sent packet by packet. T-Mobile wants to be the best at connecting... Oh, fuck. It's been a long day. <laughs> T-Mobile wants to be the best in the world at connecting people to their world. With so much of our lives these days happening through a wireless connection, nothing but the best will do. We rely on wireless to do almost everything in life, including talking to a vast. From big deals to everyday connections, if you can't rely on your network, it's going to have big consequences. That's why you can't just trust this stuff to anybody. And T-Mobile, it's America's largest and fastest 5G network. And with coverage and speed like this, why wouldn't you go with the best around? And all that to oh, say, wow. 5v5, huh? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I like that during I, that, I, you said, you just said, Fuck, I'm exhausted <laughs> during the ad read. So it's like... <laughs> that, guy, that guy is unbelievable. In the middle of that I, one. like so. That's I think this is good. I, was, I think 10-year deal with T-Mobile coming up. <laughs> I was making an apology for beef in it because I said the words all wrong, which implied that they had written them poorly or something, but I wanted to make sure that no responsibility was no. on them. It's me, the muggins who can't read. Uh, okay, let me, let me start with this. <laughs> the community response within our small community has been, the world is on fire, thing is changing, me no like change, oog oog. And also specifically, um, fear about what will happen to people who love the role of off tank or who play it professionally. Or main tank. Sure, or main tank as yeah, well, yeah. But both. although yeah. I feel like the community is not really smart enough to pick that up and they just well, they thought about off tank. Some people yeah, have said yeah. that, like Fried from Titans, Fried Wiener has sure. talked about it with, uh, on the critically yeah. acclaimed show, Dustin. Justin Bowerman show yes, for two T's. Yes, yeah. So what are, your, what are your thoughts, everybody, on the idea of Overwatch just on a basic level going to 5v5? I, I think it makes a ton of sense. Uh, I think one thing we forget, like, in our small, like, bubble, because we love the game so much, is the people who left the game. And who we'd all love to see come back to the game, because we want Overwatch to be... is as big as it could be. Uh, a lot of people that I know, personally, you know, their, their experience with Overwatch has either been, you know, goats or shooting shields. And they're kind of like, well, what is this? Uh, also, the learning curve, because the game is so fast, uh, from a first-person shooter perspective, it, it's just impossible to even know what's going on. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I gifted the game to uh, somebody play, we play WoW with, and he plays a ton of shooters and whatnot. And we got into a game. And just the things that I had to explain, like before we even got out of the spawn door, he was just like, I don't know what's happening, but okay. And like just ran out. Mm. And I think if we if we can get to a spot where the game still feels like Overwatch, right? Like it's still that fast pace, like, you know, team kind of combat, but opens it up a little bit more to be a little bit more, you know, shooting game like. Uh, go more towards those FPS mechanics. And I think just taking one player out of the equation, especially like one of the tanks, it's just a, a lot easier visually to kind of understand what's going on. Uh, I think it opens the door to more players to play our game and love our game. So that's why I'm pretty bullish on it. I also think a reason for the a big community response, uh, especially from our community, is because we hadn't heard anything about pvp so i think people just kind of expected pvp to be more of like an expansion like where hey here's a bunch of pve stuff and then pvp is going to be you know a bunch of new maps and whatnot i don't think people expected like a whole new redo kind of of pvp i yeah, think yeah that they were quiet enough uh, for long enough on the pvp that everyone just kind of assumed like hey this is going to be pretty similar you know pvp we're just gonna They'll get a bunch of new skins, a bunch of new maps, and move on. I think the fact that, one, I like the fact that PvP is being looked at in the same way as PvE is yeah, like a, a whole new experience. Uh, but I think, though, with how much talk and how much the community's mindset was that it was going to be pretty similar, now when it's not similar at all, I think that's pretty jarring for people. But overwhelmingly, I think, like, obviously there's negatives, but I think there's way more positives that outweigh that. I, I'm going to try to be pretty balanced this podcast because I've already 
made that tweet where like I told like forever ago, I was just like five five could be good, but I'm gonna try to be balanced because I understand that there are negatives as well. I think that the gameplay experience is going to change like radically, and I think a lot of players who have been around in Overwatch now for these years, we will romanticize the idea what Overwatch is about. It's about teamwork. Um, you know, you you're able to play these um, well balanced compositions where you can either go aggressively. Um, if you're like a Winston Diva duo, or you can peel uh, for your backline. You play very teamwork-oriented, versatile compositions with back and forths. Um, and I think that's the only real experience we've had with Overwatch for these past few years. Now, I think if you remove one, one hero, that's going to be enough to alter the gameplay experience and make it way more explosive um and the less about that teamwork less about the sustainability um less about the versatility or composition um and just be way more explosive essentially like a frag matters way more because there are less members on each team so i think a lot of people are just like we this is we overwatch as we know it is going to change with overwatch 2 we don't know how well balanced it's going to be we don't know what the gameplay will be we don't know if we're gonna enjoy it as much so um i think sort of what super mentioned in one clip was that there's almost like a sense of fear within the community Definitely. because they yeah. we don't know we've never played it we don't know what's happening by the scenes there were multiple heroes we we didn't see and we don't know what's happening so i think there is some of that in the community where it's like it's hard to be open-minded when we've only experienced something we love and now we don't know if that's going to be taken away from us so i think that's behind the negative community reaction a little bit i also think that avril had a really good take on this that I very much agreed with, is that everyone who's actually upset with this are people who's still around in the Overwatch community. And they have a yeah. sense of um, survivorship bias. Definitely. So just like, because yes. you are around, and because you like the game as is now, doesn't mean that it's the best for the game, or that it's like, like changes couldn't be made for the better, like big changes, like 5 versus 5. When in reality... I don't know what the player numbers looks like. I'm not going to, you know, act like I know. But it feels like it's been going downhill. And it feels like, you know, less and less people are playing. And you can make the argument that that's because of lack of updates. You know, most of the dev, dev work is focused on Overwatch 2 and that stuff right now. But it feels like, in general, a lot of people played the first two years. Then we had GOATS happen. And people stopped playing the game as much because we, like, the game changed from... It went from Widow Tracer to three tanks, three supports were a MOBA now in like the span of like a few months. And so I think a lot of people left that never came back. And then GOATS changed. And I think a lot of people left after GOATS changed because they had an idea of what Overwatch was. And now we're back to this like perfect state. So it's been a lot of like player base shifts. Like who's playing Overwatch and why are they playing? Because the game changes so much all the time. So I think 5v5 is good because it's going to be way more consistent now with the metas. And I think it's mainly functionality-wise, like Math already mentioned. It makes sense from, like, the queuing system. Um, I think it makes sense from a... I lost my train of thought. I've been ranting forever. I don't need to talk more. <laughs> but that's sort of where I look at this, where it's like, I think it's a really good change um, for the future of Overwatch. But I can also see why some people are very upset with this, because they love Overwatch as is. I just don't know if our small community represents the bigger picture. I I don't I don't think it does. Like I think when you kind of look at the overall landscape and I and I think like you know looking at it like as the kind of like survivor bias I think is a really good point because like I mentioned there's a ton of people who have played Overwatch who liked it, liked the idea of it, but then they were like, "Oh, well, I feel like I don't have any impact on the game. I'm just shooting shields. Like it just doesn't feel like how think a shooter with these awesome abilities would, right? Uh, where we all love the game the way it is now. And none of that's really kind of going away. Like all the characters will still be there. It's obviously a huge shift. Uh, but I think though, the biggest thing will be it'll play probably more like a shooter, right? Where you're kind of ha you're having to use cover, you know, there's a, I, I think also kind of more control over the game as a player, but there's some stuff that I think like people will miss, right? Like the, you know, tank synergy, I think is one that uh, a lot of people mentioned like, oh, like Ryan with Zarya and Winston Diva at like our level of play, even like Diamond, right? Diamond's like what, top 15%, right? 
Top 10%? Yeah. Might yeah, be higher top, than that, uh, honestly. I think it's top 15, but... It, I think it might it's be top higher. 15. It might, who knows? But, but even at that level, it's hard to get, like, a Winston Diva. Most people just queue tank so they can play Sigma or Roadhog uh, and don't talk to each other and just try and frag out. So uh, I, I don't know if it represents, like, what well, kind of obviously the game that we watch every week and the game we cover that doesn't really represent what the majority of the player base is playing. Mr. Vast. Connor, I mean, honestly, overall, I mean, the thing is we had a discussion before the podcast started. It's like, are we going to be the devil's advocates here? Are we going to step away? From I, I, I am. Listen, you just give your your genuine overarching yeah. thoughts on 5v5. No, no, I mean, I have my... No, the thing is, we both have our genuine thoughts, I'll, but also... I'll make sure to squirrel the devil in there every now and then. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think it's beyond just missing tank synergy for me. Because also, let's preface this, right? Because at the end of the day, if I want Matt... If I don't want to get blacklisted by Matthew Morello for future, you know, Overwatch League events, obviously, when I, I don't want to go too hard. <laughs> I don't decide um, that. But... I do don't, actually don't think there are, there's a lot of, there's it's an obvious fix for most of the issues, right? You remove one tank, so that's one less tank to balance, it's one less tank player to fill in your queues, it's one less player to fill in queues in general, right? Mm. For everything. You have less players for esports to move around logistically. Yeah. You have less players to care for to pay, sure. which requires less staff. So it's a really easy fit. And then also it puts, you know, like Matt was talking about and Johnny, you have more control as an individual player over your experience. Um, so there's a lot of very easiest, obvious fixes that were presented, right? But to, in some ways to me, this feels like the equivalent of when like, before medicine had advanced enough in the civil war and such, when you had been shot, they're like, well, we could try to save a leg or we can amputate. <laughs> um, and that's what this feels like in some ways because it's the most blunt, obvious solution. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, and to me, I think there's a very real argument to be made of like, well, the games decreased because we didn't receive a balance change for two years for mm. GOATs, right? We didn't receive like a, a meaningful balance change, right? We had balance changes, but we I didn't tried, receive. tried, I think. We tried, but I mean, the thing is yeah. we didn't really target any of the archetypes, right? And it's not, yeah. and this isn't saying that like, it's not a question of like, oh, you know, like, this doesn't inherently mean like this is not saying the devs are dumb right it's not saying the devs like didn't try it's more so they had a very different philosophy how they did balance they tried to do it but it wasn't frequent balance changes it wasn't often and it wasn't targeting many of the archetypes that people wanted them to target and this is not like and then on top of that what new content has overwatch received have we received new events have we received like mean junkenstein has been rehashed <laughs> like three years in a row oh with no God. difference Right. And so my point being is that I feel like it's a little bit more multifaceted than like we could may very much be sitting here in an argument where if we had had consistent balance and and content updates specifically and heroes too, especially heroes, no new heroes ever. Like we have when's the last time we had a new hero? Uh, it was Echo. Right? Yeah. Echo, right? Like it was, yeah. a year last ago. Year, a year, yeah, a year ago. Well, and that was already ago. when we were on a balance change of what, like three heroes a year, four? Something I like that? think Less? it was lower than that. Lower than actually, that? But I'm not sure. So compared to every other other game that it's yeah, going to be competing against, content. you know? But, yeah. And Go so on. to me, once again, it is not, I'm not here downplaying 5v5. I think 5v5 is a very obvious good solution for the long term health of the game. It just seems really easy to say, like, this was the best solution when I look at the leg and I just say, let's cut it off. I would use a different analogy. I like your analogy. I think it, it makes sense. But I think using a chemotherapy versus surgery analogy also oh, shows so. the other side of it, too. Sorry. Because okay. right, we're, we're getting explain. really what? morbid. Yeah. Before we go on, we are getting no, I mean, more morbid. You're more using more a medicine more. analogy, so I want to I okay. kind of put this one out here yeah, as sure. well. So, so if you have like a deep-seated issue, let's say cancer, for example, in, in a patient, then you can, you can go for a chemotherapy solution where you're applying medicine that uh, attacks the cells, but it also harms the host, and it's difficult to manage, sure. and you're not guaranteed to be able to get a solution. If you can get in there and surgically remove it and just get a simpler solution that doesn't harm the host okay. as much, then that might be better at the end of the day. And I think that even if, I mean, even if you end up with- a, I have no idea what one side of the argument you're on. I, I... So what I'm, what I'm saying there is that just because you're removing a player, just because you're making it 5v5, doesn't mean, that if you're an amputee, it necessarily means that you've like 
you you are living with one less limb or one less part of your well, body we that you used to have. are literally living with one less tank. But the way that that works in terms of humans is that you tend to not be able to do some of the things that you used to be able to do. Well, we can't or, play double tank. But being able to play <laughs> double tank is, ne- is not necessarily a good thing. Whereas being able to use both your arms, oh. I would say most people would say, is a pretty good thing. It's universally... Well, I mean, but some people would argue that having double always... tank is a good thing. But but not it's I not think, universally accepted to be so. so sure, I'll give you that. Thing yeah, fine. We we don't know whether the we don't know whether the amputation will actually lead to you having more fun with one arm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, which is very different well, to an I actual mean, if, amputation, yeah, where uh, no one's going around going. Hey, I well, think I was this more of the argument that actually, your other arm was gangrenous <laughs> and would kill you, right? Yeah, but I think no. when you come from the point of view that the balance has been so difficult to do over the course of these years. Being just trying to muddle your way through and say the developers could have done it better. I mean, I'm sure the developers would agree. There are times where they could have done it better as well. There, there was also many worlds in which they made it worse, I think. Like it, where they could have made a different change that they thought would make it better yeah. and it made it worse than what we actually got. Yeah. Being, simplifying the game in theory should make balancing easier. And that, that's not just purely theoretical. If you only have one tank on the field, it simplifies things massively. Yeah. I mean... Uh- People, this is why I don't get the argument recently, by the way, for people saying there should be a flex queue in the game or they should remove roll lock when they go 5v5. That shit is dumb. Yeah, when those things happen, we have always seen people just do more tanks. Think about every Overwatch meta that kind of spirals out of control. Uh, Like what? Fucking, I remember we were in, uh, was it Sweden, Johnny? I don't even remember what country we were in for Dreamhack. Uh, And it was just like quad tank. Uh, oh with God. MZ I just if it was a 2016, oh, yeah. was it a 2016 or 2017? I don't even know where that went to. That would have been quad uh, yeah. Tank, yeah, yeah. It, it, like we had quad tank, then we had uh, goats, then even with the roll queue, we did double shield. It has yeah. always been something that has, and and actually, I actually, I mean, I have no kind of knowledge of it, and I, I would, I, I would almost guess, like. For the people who are like, well, why don't they just make tanks more fun? Who remembers Sigma on release? Like, that hero was fucking fun. He was overpowered as shit, but he was fun as hell. Uh, but then because he was, like, so good and you comboed him with the other shield, everyone was like, oh, we need to nerf, like, this really fun hero because Arisa exists. Like, that world kind of sucks. Like, it, in, a, in, a, in a world of solo tank, you could have left Super Giga OP Sigma yeah. and... That role would have been super fun. That's, like, that's the key yeah, to me, is but, that when you only have one tank, you can make them broken. But insane. if you have some kind of flex queue or you remove roll lock when you go down to 5v5, you don't get that benefit. And that benefit is what solves the whole issue. For Or at least that's their theoretical solution, is well, that we can make the tanks busted, but each team only has one of them anyway, and they don't have synergies yeah, with everything else. And- but it's not fun if you're on the enemy team and your opponents play a busted tank and you play a less busted tank. So I think that argument kind yeah, of falls and, apart. And also it still assumes that busted is like going to be equal. Like in my opinion right now, looking at that current demo of Overwatch 2, why would you ever play Reinhardt ever again? But the, this is not that it, properly yes. buffed. Why would you ever play Reinhardt right ever again? And the point here is like when we simplify to 5v5, obviously I'm not ignoring your points here. I agree like with them but it still is like as we solidify the game more towards arena shooter what always is the strongest is mobility mobility will always remain the strongest facet because that's just the nature of the game because you have a bunch of people shooting you you can't just sit still and get pounded like that yeah. just sucks you won't have any impact on top of that and, and so the end of the day it's like sure you can make Sig- if you gave me release sigma to watch too he'd still be trash he can't go anywhere he can't do anything. He just gets shot. But I think you can make the same argument about like Ryan Sigma comps recently that got ran in the main melee. The Lucio does provide the mobility that a Ryan needs. At, at but the thing is, they have two. They have two shields. They have two shields. They have extra survivability. They have their the ability to peel for each other, well, to cover for each other. Oh, so you can't you do that. Also, the important also point have, here, yeah. Go, oh, Johnny. Is that an off tank? often brings to a main tank what they are lacking to combine it. Yeah. And that is what I hit on, sure. that you're missing now some of that versatility in Overwatch 2. And that is what I'm worried about. I am long-term bullish on like the balance of Overwatch 2. I think they're going to figure it out. Balance recently, it was since Rolock was introduced and you know a few changes this year, has been really good. Okay, So I have faith in the developer team. 
What is going to change, though, is what I mentioned before. I think the gameplay is radically going to change. Definitely. And with that, what I mean by that is that I think what happens if, if you remove the off-tank, that so often like rounds out the composition, it complements the main tank. So if you play a Winston that can dive forward, you have a D.Va that can use a defense matrix on him or a D.Va that can peel for you. If you play a Reinhardt that is like it's melee range and has a big shield, you can play a Saria that has uh, a lot more damage to make up for that melee range and you can actually like reach out and also serve some protection for the Reinhardt. When you remove the off tank in Overwatch 2, it will be very hard to play specialist tanks and what i mean by that is like wrecking ball because if you play a wrecking ball your team now has no shield now in overwatch one you have like a sigma to back it up and you can be like okay well the rest of our team are dps supports they have like a sigma shield or they at least have like a matrix so they have some form of protection wrecking ball doesn't have any sense of protection for his team so you're sort of forced to play like a tracer kind of comp with your uh, like a tracer dive kind of comp with your wrecking ball so you're going ultra dive essentially well, at the end of the day, like that's going either you have to mirror that or you're going to like counter those kind of compositions. So I think if you go like talk about this for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're going to reach the conclusion that you will end up just playing generalists in Overwatch 2 because you cannot play these extreme heroes like Widowmaker is going to be busted on the release because you yeah, know, there's only one is. tank. Yeah. So what will happen is Widowmaker will get nerfed because she's like a specialist, right? And she's too good. So I, I think we're going to move away from these specialist roles like Senyara. Like, why would you pick a Senyara over like an Ana, for but, example? But, but Jonathan, so, there, are uh, no, but, there are no generalist main tanks. Who the fuck is a generalist Winston. main tank? Winston. How is Winston, Winston. a generalist? Winston's a generalist he because he can... Team, he has yeah. A, yeah, he has a bubble. He also now has a long-range Tesla gun. Well, yeah, so, that's... That and on top of that, he's generalist. mobile enough to where he can get to all... And also just based off the map design for Watch 2, which is something we've gl glossed over a bit, based off this early preview of Overwatch 2 map design... I'm I'm currently looking at like what is it the Burj Khalifa about on every map oh, where like yeah, everything is vertical ground. as hell yeah. and like explain to me unless Reinhardt can physically become a rock climber and climb the walls <laughs> how he's ever going to do anything compared to Winston and or even Diva right like the the issue is is that it, like Johnny talks about these hitscan heroes are gonna shred the ever living hell out of every main tank that is not Winston. And like because he just can because he can at least get away. He can get to their LOS and you could dive them with your other DPS. And so the game has shifted from as I mean, Johnny talked about synergy with tanks and like your tanks controlling the tempo. I feel like the tanks now are more they're more so a disruptors. No. Yeah, and also they're they're more of a they're kind of reacting to the DPS picks versus your DPS reacting to the tanks. Yes. You know? Sure. And, I, yeah, I almost feel like they should. Yeah, and that, I, and, that's, I, and that yeah. means inherently though you need to pick someone that's going to be able to get away from all the damage. That's also able to get to the damage that's being received to them because Reinhardt and Arisa I mean, and all these things. Can't. I don't think that's necessarily so, true though. I think that Winston uh, comps would find it very difficult to try and contest like narrow areas. Like, I mean, if we're just looking why? at the New York area, uh, is this New York? Like down yeah. in the subway yeah. area like that, because your Winston does not have an off tank to be able to provide them um, assistance with poke damage. But what is the other team playing, right? Well, if they're they playing play? two long-range hit scans or something, then how do they contest point? You have to if you're playing dive, right? Well, I'm, I'm saying you, you, if you're able to have like a Ryan or a Rissa that's central. But if on they the play Ryan, all you do is just go kill the rest of their team, and the Ryan's just sitting on point, and then you go kill the Ryan. Right, but you're ex you're assuming there that you're able to get through whatever choke point you're talking about without taking a shit. But they can just poke go over it. and lose it. Yeah. They can just go over the so, They can go over this is, one. So they can go over I, all I of them. Another every... potential like bad thing with Overwatch 2 is that we might get into this like thing where you end up just like counterpicking every point. Like if you start out on defense on say, you know, point A. So like imagine you're defending point A Dorado, right? If you just play five heroes, it is so hard as a defensive composition to counter whatever the offense could bring out. So with five players, it's much easier for the offense to just counterpick the defense right off the bat. And so you end up in these positions where, because you're five players, you can just as a team commit to the hero counter and gain a huge advantage toward your, towards your opposition, almost like every fight on every point. But I, so another I worry is that we're just going to swap heroes pretty much all the time to get I, I, yeah. like I feel the, like you guys are going back to like over the, the mechanical advantage. I feel like you guys are going back to the basics of what people were talking about in 2016 with Overwatch though. That isn't the way that Overwatch has played before. Re removing a player is not going to change that. Like we we've, we've very very rarely had metas where they're open enough that you can rock paper scissors at the spawn. That's been an unusual thing. And just adding an off tank, uh, removing an off tank from the game doesn't create that situation. 
Like within the within the current meta right now, if you saw a, a team that's coming out on defense with a, a Winston or something, you like if you imagine the the five v five situation at the moment, okay, a team's playing a Winston and they're playing a a tracer and a I don't know an Ash Mercy in the back line or something like that. You're not going to be able to find a meta a, a counter comp more easily just because they don't have an off tank. Oh, I, I, I there's no that. there's no logical reasoning why that I think, would be I, the think case. I disagree with that simply because off tank allows you to do so much. It, it, it's, it's like Johnny said, it gives so much more flexibility to the comp to where you're able to counter threats much more easily, right? Diva allowed you to. You could play a static main tank character on the ground to contest point like Ryan or Arissa, but also contest high ground, right? And if they yeah, dove yeah, your back sure. line, you could peel your back line. Like it, it, yeah. it opened up so much flexibility to where it's a lot harder to counter comp because there's one tank there that can always but it's not, help deal with the But weaknesses. it's never going to be black and white. Like the, the, you're yeah, making it seem it as, as well. if the game is going to be fundamentally changed so that it really is just about I, your uh, hero Also, picks. I'm, I'm not saying that it could never be, uh, that it's not going to, that that's 100% a possibility. I'm just saying from someone that has seen how it's interacted, it seems like to me, we're, we're looking at this through the lens of like, well, Overwatch has never been this way, but it's like, well, but Overwatch has always had two tanks. Right, but okay, yeah. so for example, like the, the, the Reinhardt idea, the Reinhardt and the Winston, like you, you could simplify the, the game right now and just be like, well, if they're running a Reincom, just jump past them and kill them. Yeah. If they're running Rhine Sigma or something, but they use the Lucio Speed Boost to play around their map cover properly to avoid you to be able but to I mean, do but that. The thing That's is, still going to be a thing. Been, all you've done is just zone the... So let's say you're playing Winston, right? And they back away from you with the Lucio. This is my hypothetical. You drop the bubble in front of them. You're, maybe you're playing dive heroes. You've zoned the healing entirely. And then the Ryan's left alone on point, right? You think the Ryan can... A, the Ryan's not going to be able to 2v1 the support line. He just can't, generally. A, he can't because he can't move fast enough. And B, if they decide to peel back for him, then all you've done is bring them off the cart then you just dive away and you get back out again, right? It's sort of just like... The Ryan feels secondary to that fight. He's just, he is not a part of this fight. He's just a, he's a placeholder on the point. Yeah, I feel like that's how Arissa has often been in metas at the moment. So, exactly, but I you don't want to tank to work around. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to get just stuck don't know. on this conversation. Well, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we don't we'll know. So we don't want to get, don't while, get stuck right? here for too long. Yeah, we'll, we'll but wait. I feel like, I feel like essentially what I'm, what I'm saying is we're running the risks. I'm not saying this will happen because again, like I have, I have faith in the development team. But the best example I can come up with is like, if a team is playing double shield, double sniper on Junker Town, if you want to play slow, either you have to match the double shield, double sniper, or you just say, fuck it, and you just play like dive with Genji against the double sniper yeah. because you have to like swap up your style to because you can't match it in a slower comp because they're playing two shields and two snipers, right? You yeah. can't play like a brawl comp against that, or you can't like play like an Ash and one Hanzo. Like either you match it or you swap off the composition entirely. And then, if your team swatch dive against the double sniper, I'm scared that other teams will just counter the dive, and you're just like in a cycle of swapping comps to counter the other team. I'm just, I'm not saying that will happen, but I'm saying that's a risk, kind yeah. of what happened. That's also kind that of what the whole before, game was built on. But, yeah, too. it was, it was. Yeah. yeah, and I also think uh, one we don't know like how they're gonna redo and balance whether you know the tanks and then all of the other heroes that weren't shown, right? Yeah. Uh, I also think some of the some of the fears are looked through the ends of the current game, uh, especially when we talk about like not having a D.Va or a Zarya for certain tanks. Like you also have to take into account the amount of damage that's going to be missing on the other side. A lot of times, like off tanks, whether it be D.Va, Zarya, Roadhog, like they are putting down some of the most damage on their team uh, per se. So you take away all of that damage. You also now have the healers who are able to pump all of those resources into just one tank. I think that kind of changes up some of like the, there are at least impacts some of the, the fear of just like tanks getting blown up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that is something interesting. Because I, when I initially saw 5v5, I just thought these main tanks are going to get shit on. Because... Your, both of your DPS are just going to be shooting at them constantly because that seems well, like a great win condition. Well, and the DPS get, get less ult charge. Getting... They get less ult charge Cut for down. shooting the tanks. So even yeah. if you focus down the tanks, you're generating less ultimates, yeah. which are but, usually but like the big... But ults are less valuable now because there's less big health pools to burn through. You're just a lot more focused on actual neutral gunfight. The thing. The other question yeah. that I had for you guys as well is everyone's making the assumption that getting a pick is going to be more important in 5v5 versus 6v6. Do you think that's actually going to be true? Depends on the character, really. I, is yeah, what I, would I think say. It, but, uh, that's kind of how the game is now, though. Mathematically, it makes like, sense. Yeah, I mean, mathematically, it makes sense. But 
Well, I, I mean, would say tanks are inherently less valuable now. My personal opinion. I think tanks are inherently less valuable because it's just way harder for them to like... It's like if you kill the Winston, it doesn't matter because you can't build a static front anyways to work around. You can't peel for your back line consistently, really. Uh, Unless your whole archetype of your comp was like, we are going to peel for our back line. We're going to play loose. We're going to play Zen Ana, right? Mm. And our whole tank's goal is to peel for our back line when they try to dive us or something. Mm. Tanks just matter less because now DPS can just do so much more. So, so in my opinion, I, I, I think tanks just matter less now. I mean, I, I'd be kind of inclined to agree because I don't think we can actually get to the state where like you have a tank that's kind of like uh, it's like very healthy and sturdy at the same time there's a lot of damage to make up for missing one tank because then he'll just poo on DPS so I actually you know agree with that I think if this is going to be kind of balanced and fun I think tanks will just have to be bulkier like you, you won't have to get owned by a McCree flashbanging you and then just right clicking you like you need to make bulkier tanks and they're sort of like disruptors because I think that'd be kind of fun. Like, you just have a bulky or a pool and you just disrupt the enemy team. And if your tank goes down, well, the enemy team's DPS is going to have an easier time uh, because, you know, you, you don't have a tank to disrupt them. But I think it's less about tanks being able to find picks or uh, tanks just, like, solely protecting, like, your own team. It's way more about disrupting the battlefield um, and just making it more annoying for the enemy team to get value from their DPS. And I think that would be actually kind of entertaining. But I... I, I think if we look at the tank spectrum of like what tanks provide, I think one end is going to be like very bulky tanks who just like fuck with Widowmakers and like backlines. And the other end will be like super damage focused tanks that are like glass cannon tanks. I don't know if, sorry, I might not be it, but I, I think you cannot have both. You can't have a sturdy tank that does a lot of damage. And, and so you'll sort of oh, shift between like I mean, disruptor I, and, you know. I think you I can push into like an area I... that's very limited in terms of mobility. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's uh, another way yeah. of balancing that. Am I alone in hoping they actually just rename the role to brawlers? Because I feel I like mean, if you, if you been actually talking about that, yeah, I feel like if you actually just kind of took away, like if you if you were really kind of like going down this road of like making tanks aggressive and brawly, like I think changing kind of the name and also obviously changing a lot of their kits kind of reinforces the fact of that. Because I think what everybody will do is look at through the lens like this, right? Where they're all still tanks. They're they're all still in the tank category. We know what tanks historically are in Overwatch and look at it like that and say, oh my God, if I play Zarya alone, I'm just going to get destroyed, right? But if we kind of level the ball up to be beefier and more, you know, close range initiators, engagers, whatever you want to call it, I feel like you may as well just change the name. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could agree with that. I, I just... To me, it's more of so, um, it's always just an issue because as, as someone that's like played a lot of very highly mobile arena shooters, the end goal is always just mobility, right? The only reason Overwatch hasn't tended that way traditionally is simply because we have powerful enough tanks and supports to where we can overcome the value of mobility, right? We don't need to be mobile because we have immortality <laughs> and yeah. we can like play slow and we can and we're willing to sit there and take the poke right because also the little... objectives are static yes and i mean that's also are static a, as well a very crucial um, point there so there's a lot of reasons why mobility doesn't necessarily always trend towards the strongest in overwatch traditionally because we've had mitigating factors for that right but if we don't have as many mitigating factors it's hard to imagine a universe where even if you beef up zarya as much as you want um, it seems hard to find value that if you're playing double hit scan, I'm going to watch my Zarya fall into the musket line every time. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's very hard, but obviously we don't know, right? We don't know where they're going to take the balance. We don't know where they're going to go with this. And that's also a whole separate issue here for me as well too, right? We're so worried about like, well, what's the content going to be like? What's we going to add for Watch 2? But they've just committed to rebalancing the game from the ground up. The entire game's paradigm has shifted. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, like I said, I think it should be simpler for them as well because th they can't make tanks fun to play at the moment without making them broken. We were talking about off tanks being able to fill the gaps for main tanks as well, but I think one of the big things the developer team has struggled with is when that doesn't happen is when your off tank just 
adds more to what your main tank does well. Yeah. Like Sigma and Orisa, where mm-hmm. you're, you're, I mean, they're not covering for each other. They're not trying to fill in gaps well, for well each other. Well, they can. They're just yeah. fucking layering shit on top. Because, well, you can have, I mean, very traditional pro plays, you have your Sigma take the off angle, right? So, like, one thing that they can deny is when you're, someone wants to get around your shield, your Sigma's there to fuck them up. Sure, sure. But, they, I mean, you're not offering mobility. You're not offering any kind of um, access to yeah. high yeah, grounds. Yeah, for mean, sure. Yeah. Like, I think this also kind of presents, like, Obviously, different balancing issues, but when you look back at, I mean, even just the beginning of Overwatch, right? Remember, like, d- double Winston, double Tracer, double Lucio, like, you know, the six Diva stall, Classic. D- double shield, goats. I mean, we've had the, we've had everything uh, at this point. Like, you couldn't, like, with the way the game was, you couldn't balance. Like, it was just actually impossible for things like that. With hero limit zero, without yeah, hero, right? Absolutely. Remember with yeah. well, right? Well, first they had to to start to get the balance in the right direction. You had to put in the one hero limit, right? Uh, and then even with that, you still had like issues in certain situations with like quad tank, right? Uh, things along that nature, you know, three DPS in certain situations. Uh, and then what had to? And then when we got to goats, there was like. You either made the tank super weak, so you just played ball with three DPS, or the tank stayed as they are. You played, you know, just run people down, whether you had Brig in the mix, but then you just subbed that out for like Moira, right? Who just pumped out tons of healing. Like, but then you can't just nuke the HPS because there's so many other things that people play. So then we went to 222. Like, I view this as the the next version of that, pretty much. It's well, like now that we're in 222. You see, like, even with Sigma, who is probably designed to be a main tank, he's most like he's played mostly in the off tank role, like exclusively in the off tank role, right? Where I think now you see like the, if it's weird because once things get out into the community, obviously we do just crazy shit with them, where they probably design a tank thinking they're an off tank or a main tank, and then they end up the opposite, and then you combo two main tanks together that they think, and then it becomes an issue, right? So. I view 5v5 more as like the next version of one hero limit roll lock type of sure. situation. Yeah. Obviously well, much like <clears throat> larger shift though. So to, to kind of wrap up this conversation, I actually don't think that that argument holds too much weight simply because we're in a really balanced meta right now. And so the counter will be like, well, we don't need 5v5 because the meta is actually really balanced right now. Maps matter. We're in one of the best states in a very long time. But this is where the functionality of 5v5 and what it means to as like a player when you open up or watch yeah. and play it, this is where 5v5 is better, regardless of the balance, in my opinion. So how many times have we I been mean, in a good meta times. and then we and then we get like obviously we, we haven't gotten a hero in a while, but we get a new hero, we get some balance, and then all of a sudden we're just in you know, oh, that's gonna happen in five v five too. I promise. Yeah, it'll happen in five v five as well. Yeah, yeah. some yeah. busted ass DPS that just like blows up some tank because they're like triple shotguns or something. I don't know. They're gonna do some wonky <laughs> shit. It's gonna happen. But triple like, I, I don't know. But it's like I, I think it comes down to like the basic systematic features, like waiting for tank queue for like five minute blows, and that can't be like the ranked experience for most um, players. Um, I think one common complaint actually. When I talk to people who play in the lower ranks of Overwatch, is that because it's a six v- six versus six game, it doesn't feel like they have any deciding factor whether they win or lose the game. And the only way you really feel this is if you play like a Widowmaker and you get like two or three picks, because then it's visible. You feel the impact you had on the fight itself. But if you play like an Orisa and you're like in silver, gold, or like even plat, sometimes it's hard to feel like you're contributing to the fight at all. And with 5v5, because kills are way more important, I think it's easier for those players to feel like they have an impact and therefore enjoy Overwatch. And also when it comes to losing, understanding why you lost rather than just like, hey, my team didn't click and our team didn't work with just like these five random people in ranked. And so we just ended up losing the game. It feels like you're not in charge of the gameplay. But when it comes to 5 versus 5, I feel like each individual has more like they they're more like there's a word here they they determine the outcome of the game in a player a better... agency yeah. yeah they have more player agency and i think that's is also good for overwatch so there are all these like small things around the overwatch experience as a whole and not necessarily the balance itself 
or like uh, yeah i just feel like 5v5 it just makes the experience way more simplistic and hands it back to the players rather than just like a random matchmaker where you know you have like boosted mercies because the other five other players can win the game and you know stuff like that well since we're going 5v5 can we wreck scoreboards i mean they have actually said that they're interested in doing Because the that. thing is, now our scoreboards actually make sense. Because now if your tank dies 20 times, it's like, well, you know, we got owned, right? But we only have one tank uh, and the DPS mat do more picks. I we actually scoreboards. think scoreboards would make the game less toxic. Is that if like we a have a, if I want a scoreboard. So my Genji player that's permadiving in 5v5, if he gets like two kills over like 45 minutes, I want to know. I want to <laughs> know if he only gets like two kills. I think part of the reason kills. that people get so mad is the mystery of what everybody yeah. else is doing. I have yeah. no idea like oh, what the hell like it, my support is doing or or whatnot so then you just start blaming the the person and then they start blaming another person but now maybe having a scoreboard sense would a increase toxicity but i don't know they make sense as a measurement now though because yeah. dps actually have a much more quantifiable impact with less players so you literally can measure the impact far more directly yeah, no, through a I, scoreboard i agree scoreboard with that. should come back i don't agree that they're going to reduce toxicity though oh, i just think sure they're going to allocate I mean, honestly, it in the right places reducing toxicity to me i don't i feel like it's like kind of a nonsense argument. It's just the culture you set from the game sure. versus like the features generally. Like I'm sure there are, there are arguments to be made, but like that's just my general vibe across all my lifetime yeah. of games. Like it's just the culture that's set. But scoreboards I, actually make sense now in 5v5. I, I want to start moving us on from this topic, but not exactly yeah. moving on from 5v5 yet because it was such a big part of this week. But I want to ask some more focused questions to you guys and get some snappy answers. The first one being... Matt's argument is one that gets brought up a lot about a lot of players having left over time because they've become a little disenfranchised with how much of a MOBA um, or the MOBA elements, the CC, those kind of things, that have, the shields that have become the core features of Overwatch. How realistic do you think it is that moving towards the core shooter fundamentals of Overwatch is actually going to recapture that audience? How realistic is that versus the people that you might disenfranchise now who are in love with the current level of the game. I'd actually say it's really kind of determined on like what the landscape is like whenever the game comes out. Like we still don't know when the game comes out, but I can tell you right now, there's a ton of people on like Twitch and people streaming who have no idea what the hell to play. They're looking for another shooter to play. Like there's that nothing true, like yeah. nothing out. Like, if it was coming out, like, you know, next week, Back I'm sure everybody on the internet would be super hype. I don't even know what that what is. you see? <laughs> I said, what about Lawbreakers? <laughs> but oh, oh, everyone yeah, forgot yeah, about Lawbreakers, was a, was I guess. Yeah, you didn't was... even know what that was. I've never even heard no, of that. I, okay, I know go what on, Matt, is. Sorry. I mean, a lot like, of uh, top streamers at the moment are playing Valorant, and it seems like almost their arm have been twisted into it. I feel like some of them yeah, are, they, are not that interested uh, in the game. They're just looking for something to play. Or they're playing Warzone, and they're like, yeah, it's all right. right. They were just like, oh, hey, like, I had fun when Overwatch came out. Let me try it again. And there's a bunch of new PvE shit. The multiplayer is all new. Like, they're not shooting at shields. Like, yeah, I mean, people are still playing Fortnite, right? I mean, uh, where's the hot tub yeah, category? Yeah, but, mate, you're not stealing people that much from Fortnite. Where's the That's hot tub category? No. The audience is not similar. That's why I'm saying how so realistic is it? from hot where tubs it? either, Kurt. Where's yeah, the hot tub category? Kurt, your horny that? little dog, where's stop the, it. I'm asking for yeah, the hot Yeah, and you're even category? worse. You're a terrible, <laughs> terrible influence. Uh, I think you have a better... I think you have a better chance to keep some of those... Uh, at least get those people to come back and give it a try. And okay. I think... And I think when those people came back and gave it a try, if it's the same type of game they left and whatnot, I think it would be a quick try, right? Where I think uh, there's still a bunch of people who are excited about the story and whatnot. I I think it gives a, a better chance to broaden the player base and bring new people in. I, I, I'll i be a bit snappier, if you don't mind. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, What's sorry, I wasn't very really yeah. snappy. I, w I was also going to say, a lot of the people that I've talked to, I think they're already hooked anyway. Mate, if you've been playing yeah. Overwatch for five years, you're probably hooked. Yeah, it's essentially an opiate. Yeah. You're playing it's right now, you're still going to play. Yeah. You probably are. It's, uh, there's a lot of talk of like, I'm an off-time main, I'm never going to touch the game again as soon as it comes out. Mate, f who, who the fuck are you kidding? If you're still around, you ain't going anywhere. You yeah. ain't going anywhere, you're hooked, <laughs> brother. Yeah, you're you are well, you're that to you. the Overwatch League. No, I'm just kidding. That was too <laughs> the People who are like, oh my god, like this is the worst thing ever. Like, um, as soon as they start showing some story shit, all those people are going to be like, oh my god, I gotta play that. That's right, what I care possibly. about. I mean, it, um, it, it does hit, like, both sides of the, of the debate, I feel. Jonathan? So, 
my snappier answer to this is actually a bit um it disregards like the the human emotion a bit there's a word for that without sounding okay. like a fucking yeah, robotic you know, i mean also you robot. could say you could say yeah, it, uh, it's a bit what robotic it, uh, but cruel callous no pat uncompassionate pathological <laughs> Yeah, my, my, my view on it is essentially like if you look at soccer, which has like 11 players, right, on each team. Yeah. Right. There's 11 players and there's like barely any goals. OK, so what happens is people get bored of soccer because there's barely any goals. Right. But the beauty to the people who watch it is it like the teamwork, right, between the 11 players, okay, you know, the right, formations yeah. they play, the passing, setting each other up. Right. But way the human brain thinks and the way like casual folks think it's just like more goals good more scores good and that the equivalent in overwatch is headshots okay so <laughs> removing team play aspects and teamwork aspects and just focusing on headshots and shooting people i think there's just more fans of that over team play in general so even though i am part of the, the main tank uh, group that just like you know like doesn't have aim, can't aim for shit. I just like leap around and move around. Like that's what I do as a tank. I still think that by simplifying Overwatch and making it more about shooting people and removing shields, there are just going to be in general more fans of that kind of gameplay over what we currently have. And I think I, that will lead to a player base. That's, that's not a robotic take at all, by the way. I actually can't believe no, that yeah. you used, used football as the example, the most popular sport in the world. Well, first of that, all... Ha that hasn't really had a more popular, smaller version. Instead of cricket or okay, rugby... Okay, but if you want to like get 20, advanced, 20 cricket okay, or 7v7... That is because cost of entry, Sideshow. Because all you need to play a so a soccer is like a small not, little ball. I'm if you want to play basketball, that's I mean. you need hoops. It's a bad analogy. You need hoops, yeah. okay? That's complicated. If you want to play hockey, okay, you need goals. You need, you need fucking... The things they they wear on the feet i can't remember what it's called the ice um, skates you got me yeah. now. Um, the I mean, cost of entry to soccer is really really cheap and so that's why it's the most popular sport i mean in the world. I watch not because, because of the dynamics of I the game fifa street four mm -hmm. player mm -hmm. soccer that's the good shit right there okay okay four i'm just saying all right we're gonna ignore all okay, of the well, molding I, also, fans his, in the comments the thing is is that like that wasn't even a robotic take because johnny you literally wanted yeah. the most human emotion possible which is that humans are stupid <laughs> like that, you literally just went with the most human option possible there of like humans like to see flashy shit and like that's yeah i mean yeah why do we have why are diamonds expensive sure i mean sure let's go on i've got another question for you all as well which is um what is this going to do at the professional level there's been a lot of talk about off tanks going to lose their jobs we're going to be essentially cutting all of the off tanks from the overwatch league or even some people also saying well think of the main tanks those guys aren't potentially as skilled when it comes to mechanics maybe right. they're all going to lose their jobs overwatch league on esports consultant avast that is me give me the take on what you actually think is going to go down if you are running if you're running the dallas fuel which you were two weeks ago i was yes till you got fired till they rejected my salary yeah. Ocean, yeah if you if you had to trim that roster down to 5v5 and it's the first year of overwatch 2 what do you do well, actually, there's a really good argument here. We've already had this discussion a lot on... Uh, I'm not going to plug my own. That'd be bad. But the, <laughs> the, so essentially, the, what Albert, um, the Mayhem GM, yeah, he and also a lot of other people, coaches and stuff that were coming through and players were talking about was that right now we already have... like why Since we already have two takes on a team, it's not expected for one tank player to know every role already to begin with. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So... Why wouldn't you still have another tank player on your roster to play a different tank on a different map? Yeah. You know? Because you're not you're not gonna expect every tank player to know how to play every tank role. Is that eight, nine tanks in the game? Seven. How What's many? Sorry? How many are in overall? Seven. Seven? Yeah, I mean to be fair, we really? haven't had new heroes in like a long time. So I like, thought there was more. And we just added realize. like DPS and supports, not a lot right, of tanks. Right. In fact, that's what everyone's I guess they've only had, when we talk they've about content, they've only added three tanks, tanks right? What's oh, right? They've only added three tanks since the start. Yeah, they haven't right? added too many tanks. I mean, they I mean, I, I assume there's going to be at least one more added when we get to Overwatch sure, 2. But sure. But the point uh, being, you're not going to have you're not going to have one person one person that can play every tank is a unicorn. Yeah. Like yeah. there are very few people that are able to do that. So already teams are going to probably be looking at having a tank. Yeah. You know. So but that still keeps the two tanks argument. But then it's more of a question of well, what do you do with your backup backup tank? You know. Sure. Like when you have three tanks on a team you're probably going to get rid of one of them. You'll have two tanks. I can imagine lots of teams having two tanks. Yeah. In fact, I feel, I feel it, personally like it would yeah. almost be irresponsible, at least in that first season, when you don't know what the metas are going to be exactly. and you don't know how good your players are going to be at being able to play a bunch of different tanks. And you don't even really know what the game is going to look like. Yeah, two tanks would make sense. Would, one tank you would, would have be to like... have at least two. 
Yeah, that's unless like, you get like a unicorn player like Super. Like if you have Super, Super can play off sure. tanks. Super can play main yeah. tanks. Yeah. So like there are players that can you can Genji. get them, What's but sorry? there's not many. He can play Genji. Yeah, he can play Genji. He can play Genji. He can well. he can play Lucio. He used to have a 4600 Lucio account. <laughs> and right. I also just think we don't know. Like I I think a lot of main tanks were like, oh man, I'm good. Like in my head, I'm like, well, if they make them all like brawly and more mechanically skilled, like yeah. I feel like the off tanks are probably going to be better off. Like I, I think it's but easier. But they're still for... going to be main tanks, right? The role itself yeah. is probably more going to be similar to a main tank role, though. I feel probably. I, I feel like less. Well, it's. I mean, because you only have two options to go with tanks, right? You make them. You make them. They do more damage, or they can take more damage and build. Yeah. They take more space. And there's only two options. You can't do them both. If you do them both, then you have God. <laughs> so like, there's only I... one way to go. So, so you imagine everybody has two tanks. There's, uh, I, I have a list. Uh, there's 10 teams in the league who have three tanks or more. Chengdu That's has so four. half the teams in the league. Uh, yeah. Chengdu has four. Boston has four. Uh, and then there are some teams who have extra tanks, but those tanks haven't played and most likely won't. Uh, yeah. You, you kind of look at like, uh, and, and the Outlaws just moved into the category because they had a Dreamer, but otherwise, like, you know, they wouldn't have been in there. But, like, Hunters have four, the Spark have three, the Valiant have three, uh, the Fusion have three, but they probably wouldn't have had three if Poco would have made it to Korea. Which, by the way, uh, these teams that have four tanks have got backup off tanks and back who and only, tanks. yeah, and backup main tanks yeah. who are and only playing, like, four roles each. Yeah. So they're valuing backups for a tiny hero pool and so you're probably gonna want to value backups and but we also don't know thing. and it pretty much it holds true for the first season right it after yeah. the first season meta develops and then we see knows? how five five works yeah. who knows but for the first season yes i can imagine everyone having two tank slots but still yeah. the objective truth with that even though even though that is the case is that it will effectively cut the number of slots you could have currently in half that's kind of just the objective truth. Like yeah, but I, like I think the likely there. number of jobs lost is somewhere around 20%. Sure. I, I mean, I think it's a tad higher than that, but I, I tend to agree. And also, you also have to refine, like, what players do you want on your team in an unknown environment? What, do you want someone that has a very specific hero pool, or do you want a more generalist, like, off tank or main tank? Right? Sure. So there's also more refining that can take place within, but there, there is no way around it. People mm. are not, players are going to lose jobs. It's just... Is it going to be as severe as we, is it going to be the end of main off tank as we know it or main tank? Probably not. It will it refine as we go on and change the role further. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Jane thing's ridiculous. I mean, that's yeah, just, yeah. I mean, it was this bait. It's got to be no, bait. No, the thing is, it it had, because I, as someone that has worked with Jane, Jane has a very, I would argue Jane has probably one of the, as someone that's been involved in esports in the Overwatch side, he probably has, as an esport creator and someone that's been a coach for, He's one of the most like pulse to the casual community people in the scene. So I looked at this and I was like, has Jane got a brain eating amoeba? Because this is something he'd never post. Mm. I'd never see Jane posting this. So I don't know where, where he's come from that. I honestly can't believe because I would, I honestly would, would think he would be the opposite opinion. When it, Cause that's what he's always told, told me about. He's talked about casual community to me and like yeah, the casual yeah. aspect of Overwatch. So I'm, it was a little. Right, I don't right. know what he was going with this. I also honestly. think though that there could be a large amount of tank turnover uh, when it comes sure. to Overwatch. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Like the yeah. the tanks uh, that are good might be rookies that you've never heard of at the moment who just well, are suddenly a lot better at the Overwatch Two version of tanking. That could definitely. I, I do happen. wonder as well if the tanks become fatter DPS, like, and you're some bench DPS player. Do you even think about trying to play tank if they're more mechanically demanding and like? yeah skillful yeah. like who knows right but i do think the tank role itself as well we're talking about mechanics but i do think the decision making for tanks is going to be so drastically different than their current iteration that there's going to be a lot of considerations to take place with your tank player because your tank player essentially is going to have to be the sigma male <laughs> so i'm he's going to have to be a lone wolf that also yeah. is able to synergize and he just chooses not to be the alpha and so that's for all of you other sigma males out there definitely not a made-up term okay um the the other thing that was in here is uh well actually the other questions are so minor i don't even want to get clogged up in them to be honest uh i feel like we did that some level of justice uh the next thing to talk about though was that they did um they did an ama right yeah did, i have yeah yeah were there uh, other I, things that you wanted to talk about that they talked about on the live stream 
Because they talked um, about push as well a little bit more and that kind of stuff. I thought push looked good time. as a game mode, like something that kind of uh, keeps like a fast pace. Uh, something that's like a complete casual, nothing to do with competitive or even like, like the maps look fucking gorgeous. I mean, they always do a great oh. job with the maps, but like. I mean, map uh, design. Eh, map, yeah. Map look. Map, map looking. Excellent. They do look good. They look great. Yeah. Like an Italian car. Um, <laughs> some of the stuff they mentioned uh, from the AMA that they did uh, today uh talked about cross play uh that they're excited about the possibilities of cross play and cross progression but they don't have anything to announce today uh mm. it would make sense to tackle cross play first and then explore cross progression as a potential add-on um cross play would be huge for the game by the way if they oh, it would uh, be massive cross play is one of the biggest things that gets people uh, or, or rather it can like people going yeah it can push the game into a mainstream direction because people can play with their friends on any platform and just being able to um, participate in a game when you're th hopping onto a, a a mobile or a switch or something like that and be involved in the main oh. community not your own segmented community that either is running like a later yeah. patch or you feel like you're playing a totally different game because the balance is unbelievably the different crossplay is torb though Torb. Torb is the problem with crossplay. I've heard the biggest problem is Farah because people. I'm can't sure aim. that too. Torb and Farah both. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I mean, if I'm I mean, on, they... if I'm on my my mobile device, like I'm, <laughs> I, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do um, there? The, VR goggles. And you just point yeah. uh, another question was uh, in the live stream we saw May had lost a freeze, and it's mentioned that McCree could potentially lose his stun. As you want the tank world to be more crowd control oriented rather than DPS, and in turn you were looking to nerf mobility due to less CC options available. My question is, how is this going to affect someone like Doomfist and to a lesser extent Hammond, where their kits rely so much on CC and mobility to function correctly? Reducing both these things could utterly destroy the characters in both balance and class fantasy. Uh, the question here was, uh, the response, uh, the does this doesn't mean that tanks will gain more CC or that they'll lose damage and focus on CC more. It's more that removing some CC effects on existing non-tank heroes, it means that the current tank lineup would retain the majority of their CC effects as part of their role. This, is, this not only gives tanks something unique and interesting to their role, but it also significantly reduces the amount of CC effects in the game as a whole, especially in a world where there's only one tank per team. Uh, this isn't a hard rule either. Currently, we're pretty happy with Honest Sleep Dark, for example, so I don't think we change it just to fit with the new paradigm. As for ha uh, Doomfist slash Hammond, Hammond is a tank, so it's okay that he has more CC effects. Doomfist is a hero we need to look at, though, for, for other reasons as well. He can be frustrating to play against for many other reasons. Uh, I'd say the, the more pressing matter for us is how powerful Doomfist slash Hammond and other high mobility heroes such as Tracer can be in a world where there's a lot less CC slash control to stop them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's a crucial element because not only that, but also the long range hit scan, like we've been talking about, Widow. Like in the world that they're building, those characters are busted, and they need to come up with a balanced design that tackles those yeah. things, um, because DPS are just going to be running riot at that point, and that is not fun if you're like a support that's getting snacked on by by dps and you don't have like a mccree that can play with you with a flash or you don't have the diva that can turn around and peel for you it's just two supports trying to heal yeah. each other in the back uh this was an answer from uh aaron uh what pvp maps map types are for gothenburg and in india i guess they had shown gothenburg oh, or at least yeah, yeah gothenburg yeah, right. india i guess they talked about it wait the whole uh, of said, india uh, is a map yeah, yeah. uh yeah years this years is the complete. answer um <laughs> Uh, I don't think we'll officially announce PvP maps for either of these locations. However, if we were to make maps for them, it would be a great idea for built some super exciting as yet to be unannounced game mode. Hmm. New game modes would be cool. I worry about pushers again, yeah. honestly, myself. Because I don't know if you feel this way, Josh, but as someone that came from TF2... Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was lost in a little world there. Uh, I was yeah. reading this. Oh. Sorry, just at one no, moment. Go, go with this first. They're, they're saying that they didn't announce PvP map types for Gothenburg. Someone else afterwards is saying 99% sure, this one here, 99% sure Gothenburg was shown and it was an assault map at the time. So they're changing it from being an assault map into the new game type mode. Yeah. Huh. I mean, this just shows to me that, like, if okay. I, I'd be pulling the same shit if I was a game dev, I'd like throw out an idea in the pre show and tell them, sure, like, wait, yeah, you did yeah. this. And I'd be like, ah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm not a, doing that. It's actually, a, it's a changing situation, right? Like, what kind of game mode would you guys want to see added? Are, were you going to say five CP? 
No, no, oh, I was actually going with the inverse with the, because I was going to make the point that Zero push. CP? No, oh, yeah, CP? we don't play the game actually. We just uninstall. <laughs> no, the point being was when I saw push, it worried me as someone that played five CP in Team Fortress Two mm. because of the fact that like it is such it can be such a ridiculously long. Well, um, that, this has this actually had a match timer that was seven minutes. Yeah, which Eight is why minutes, it's good yeah. that they've added a match timer yeah. um, to that. But it still worries me because, like, when we talk about viewers not knowing what's happening in a fight, even with a match timer, I feel like push can create incentives where teams fight for a really long time. So I have awesome, the opposite take of that, no? I think, oh, I am so in love with push. I think it's a you phenomenal game thing. mode. Really? Oh, well, I don't, I mean, there could be scenarios where teams are scrapping over the yeah. objective for a long, long time. Um, but I think that comes down to map design and tuning the respawn waves, right? So that if sure, you get Sure, sure, yeah. But I'm just basing off what I've push. seen from the map design so far. Sure, and I, I yeah. think those things might need to be tweaked. But the game mode at its core, I think could be the best game mode that we have in Overwatch so far. Yeah, I mean, I, I could agree with that, yeah. But the, sure. One of the big reasons is that you have that central objective that's such an easy focus to tell people what's going on. If you show your, your, my dad, if I tried to teach my dad what was going on at the moment in Overwatch, he'd be like, I don't have a clue. Even the idea of standing on an objective to unlock it, and yet if someone else is also stood on it, you stop that progress completing, is a foreign concept to people. It's actually quite difficult to understand if you haven't played. I mean, doesn't push work the same capture way? Capture the hill kind of things. Instead of someone's touching it, they can't move. But what I think is very, it's very obvious visual progress That's happening. That's fair, yeah. And so all you have to say to them, it's like, it's like the ball on a football pitch. It's like, if the ball is going that way and it's close to that goal, they're probably going to win because they'll eventually punt it in the goal. Mm. And so I think just being able to follow that robot and say, if he's moving up and down the map, that's which team is winning. It's a very visual indicator of who's got the m momentum on their side, which doesn't really exist because the closest we have at the moment is like, control i guess where the timer ticks up at the top but i don't think that's as easy for people yeah. to get to grips with and also the whole control point mechanic i think is more difficult for people who are outside the game or maybe escort but escort you can be winning without actually advancing the payload whereas that is unlikely to happen in push i feel like it feels yeah. like a lot of the fights have to happen around the objective because of all the different flanking routes that they've added in there I think it could be really cool. I, I'm uh, I'm hyped for it. Plus, it can't. I would draw. love to see them do something like a uh, oddball from Halo, like you kind of control a neutral objective, but you can run around the entire map with it and earn time. And I think that would be kind of cool to see. What, like but, you, you have to run away with with the the ball. I have a distinct feeling that Soldier would be really good at that game. <laughs> what about Sombra? Yeah. She just Sombra. goes invisible. Well, to be fair, I felt like well, they you would have to. Be she couldn't the, go invisible. Yeah. Fuck you, I hide. Around. But I have a feeling Soldier. I mean, also probably they wouldn't let Soldier um, sprint either. While yeah. They were to do that. Um, so. I think it might be so, broken uh, in Overwatch. So you could just go like Farah into the skybox and hide in a. Exactly. In a, There's so many ways. Hide on to a rooftop somewhere. <laughs> um. Uh, oh, have you guys considered adding a ping system into the game? It would really help with communication. Uh, so we definitely considered this. In fact, we have a prototype of it running internally right now. We don't make a habit of promising things to players until they are officially announced, and I'm not going to break that tradition now. Uh, but it's something that we're excited about as a team and we're working through issues currently. I think a ping system would be awesome. Like, we have a ton of voice commands, like, with the wheel thing, but it's yeah. still not the same being able to just like click on a map. The game's quite fast paced. I actually, uh, yeah, I, uh, that's the thing I was going to say. I've yeah. inverse my opinion on pings. It's very different than like a game like Valorant or something where like there's a very static or area that if you're you ping, fighting. If you ping a guy in Valorant, he's They're probably going to be there. They're probably going to be there. Later. Yeah, but with Overwatch, like when you have Tracer and Winston ping and, such, for, oh, he's gone. And, and then also there's always just the added complexity of well with the ping that you always have the chance like people control with pings, right? And like oh. they'll spam everything, right? Like the spam guess, and ping. Yeah. Obviously, you could probably fix that through like having excess ping, like yeah. timeouts, stuff, <clears throat> type of things like that. But could I've actually reversed saying, my like, opinion on ping. It could okay. be good for saying like there's a sniper there, but then you'd have to get LOS to <laughs> ping it because there's no mini map in this game yeah. anyway. Yeah. So unlike in Valorant, where you could you could say, oh well, I know there's a guy with an RP here and ping it on the mini map. You can't really do that. But it could Overwatch. be good if it's implemented really well, right? Yeah. Like yeah. if they do it really well, it could be good. Yeah. It, it, I got totally two good. more. Um, okay. Uh, so the uh, so the question was, uh, so you mentioned in this news blog that Bastion's getting reworked from the ground up. Are you able to share some things you're trying with Bastion? They said, sure. Reapproaching uh, Bastion, the biggest starting point is what is the core of the hero that feels like we should make sure to preserve? 
The answer is that he's a transforming robot with huge damage potential when using his various modes well. We want to make sure Bastion isn't purely about aim skill, but he also has focus on situational awareness, timing, slash positioning. We're looking at pushing his recon forms range, which is him just standing there with his fucking gun, uh, out by changing his recon weapon. This helps him generally be more useful, but also helps create separation between his other forms, especially Sentry. For the Sentry form, the cost... The cost of reducing the mobility to gain and damage uh, is still interesting. It's the heart of what makes him work. However, completely removing his mobility has proved too harsh of a penalty. Uh, and frankly, it's not realistically possible to balance him with the downside in mind. So right now we're testing allowing him to move in sentry form just more slowly than normal. This huh. comes with the tuning force sentry weapon, of course, and it isn't quite as deadly as Overwatch 1. Okay, uh, that's interesting i feel like one of the biggest annoying factors with, well i mean he's so specialized that he's one of the only characters that just simply is a bit of a meme pick yeah. like there's never been a well there's been no, one meta Iron actually Glad. when he was yeah. Glad meta, when he was but that was Giga. Good. oh my god Iron Glad meta, when you could that was bomb him and he'd live. <laughs> no one liked that though I, no I, nobody I, liked I, that i think it was funny no, i you actually didn't. remember really this because this was in oh we're going flashbacks now this was 2017 right 2017 yes, it was. It was 2017 yeah so I, we were feel. actually we were in we, we were playing in apex season two we we're misfits at the time and the day i think like the day that patch was released like we were out of apex season two or something and then like this patch came out and we screamed uh lw blue who turned into new york excelsior at the time and they had like a 90 percent win rate in scrims against us like they were just fucking they were the best team in the world that was scrims. four years ago yeah. they were fantastic this patch hits and us misfits us lobies we just started like rolling lw blue with bastion comps and we play like <laughs> Bastion, Mercy, Diva, just Reinhardt, just move this Bastion around. It was so dumb, Ironclad. It was ridiculous. It just ruined uh, everything. Oh my god, there's videos of him like in Death Blossoms losing like 10 HP. Yeah. Like there's somewhere he's like so a self destructs right in front of him and he went from 300 to 150 health. Like it was, it was so crazy. I remember when it was on the PTR, I was like, ah, oh, there's no way it's going to go live. And I remember I saw it go live. I was like, I'm going to go play some ranked. And everybody, he was like Soldier 76 on steroids. You're just mowing people down. They, they throw 10 ultimates at you. You just sit there, burr, 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 and just fucking heal yourself up. It was wild. They announced so Arisa good. that week, too. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Long time ago. Yeah. It was really, really good. I remember sleeping them in a scrim. We slept them and we diva bombed them. And the enemy team nanoed the Bastion and he lived on top. <laughs> diva bombs on top of him and he lived. He just survived the diva bombs. So it was like um, incredible. But I don't see how All Bastion right, so is there. No Honestly, to me, Bastion is another case of like, I legitimately don't know how they make him work without like such a ridiculous redesign that it changes a lot of the things that makes him like good at times. Because like, it's yeah. once again, we've gone 5v5. So his, his weaknesses that were already weak in Overwatch with mitigating factors like tank peel are now even less yeah. than before. And, and he's, he's a hyper He would have to be like crazy mobile and like with a lot of like, with such insane flexibility that... It's not even Bastion anymore, right? Essentially, at that point. Yeah, I don't know yeah. how they're going to deal with that. But, I mean, they must have found it a challenge to yeah. balance him at the moment because that's I'm interested to see it. I mean, he's cool. I like a cinematic. And that's part of the reason I think that you, you have to, like, make... If you're going to make these big, like, changes, it has to be with, like, Overwatch 2. Like, you couldn't just remove, like, five heroes from the game for an extended period of time for reworks. Like, yeah, it's just not yeah. Yeah. possible. And then... Uh, uh, the question was, uh, Aaron said recently that they were looking uh, to announce something big for Overwatch 1. What is a rough estimate on when we can hear news about this new feature? Uh, and Aaron responded, we have several exciting things coming to Overwatch. As far as a rough estimate go, one large feature will be announced somewhere in the time frame between soon and really soon. So that's, that's, at that's, least I mean... I'm, I'm tired of Aaron already. <laughs> I'm tired of that guy. <laughs> get, him in, yeah. get him in here. Get him to Austin. Several exciting things coming to Overwatch. One large feature. Hmm. I mean, there's really just literally zero things to go on there. There's some. Just zero there's things. There's some things. I mean, what, what are some of the big things that could be coming to Overwatch? The Overwatch... I mean, he says Overwatch. He doesn't say Overwatch 1, as if he means the entire universe. So he could even be meaning, like... A Netflix show carries. or something fucking yeah, bonkers, right? Like, that's he could be, mean... 
He could mean anything like that. Or he could mean that the game's going free to play or something. Or he could mean that the, there's a massive battle pass. Patch. Give me a battle pass. Yeah, or Gotta something have a, like have that. a battle pass. You get like rare skins and stuff. Could be anything. Much. Just win. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you can earn anything. skins through playing arcade already in the events. So, the like, yeah, yeah. so like, I don't. Free to play would be cool, though. I've been a big proponent of free to play for a long time. I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't, I think I, I, I find it hard to believe that you can have like a very big game these days without free to play. I, I'm right there with you. I think like, you need free to play and cross play. You need free to play cross play. Yeah. Yeah. But I still, I'm still skeptical on cross play. They would have to limit the cross play in some ways because I better not see any mobile users in my cross play games. I think you'd have to opt into yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, if you did opt into it, I would be still pissed. Or are you saying like or both they would sides do it could just opt like into it? A, oh, right. oh, yeah. But if both sides could opt into it, yeah, then sure. And you, can you imagine like if Fortnite. it went free to play and we're like, we're not going to give you all the characters. You have to unlock them. So you start off with Soldier, Winston, <laughs> and Senyara. And that's all you can play. And then you have to earn credit to unlock new <laughs> Yeah, rivals. that definitely would not I work. Hate the shit. Current over I hope they do... never do that shit ever. Hate it. Yeah, that shit's whack. Um, you'd have to do uh, cross play how like Fortnite did it, where it's like. Uh, people with the same inputs play with each other right. only yeah. and then like i think when you like when you're playing with like a mixed group you have like mixed lobbies or something like that and sure. maybe they just say like there's no cross like cross play for quick play and everything else but, but no cross ranked. play for comp like a ranked yeah, yeah i mean there's a ton of shit you can do right sure sure um okay Moving away from this, I'm sure we'll continue to have more discussions on this. I absolutely do not believe that this is the... And Matt's, Matt's not going to say a fucking word about this. But I do not believe that this is the last we're hearing from stuff like this. This felt like a huge announcement because they needed to inform the community that it was going 5v5. Oh. But there's also massive redesigns of heroes that are needed to be done in the future and like more teasing stuff about Overwatch 2 down the line. So they've got to be doing more stuff like this this year. A part they, of me is kind of like... They actually did respond um, about this in oh. an AMA oh, they they? with the content creators as well. And they were like, they didn't want to promise anything, but they were like once a month or once every two months, they'd like to uh, get videos out. Or not videos, but like uh, updates out about Overwatch Oh, 2. developer updates you, and stuff, mm, right. Yeah. yeah. Could okay. you yeah. imagine though, like... If, if if they just didn't say anything up until like i don't know like let's say like hey guys like it's blizzcon we're gonna do a beta we're gonna do this like it's gonna be great oh by the way it's 5v5 everyone would be like what <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah. And just like and they would have just like slid minds. it in like a last minute like yeah the game releases in three months by the way multiplayer is 5v5 <laughs> like check it out winston can shoot long range now <laughs> and, and reese has got like a like a fucking medieval shield like i don't know like then people would have been like what the fuck is happening happening yeah i feel like it's info you had to get out like i agree you had to get a yeah. you had to inform people and set expectations now yeah. so that they can come to terms with that and also just get a feel for what's happening i mean also i feel like they need some kind of closed beta or open beta to get feedback from people properly at this point now. i mean they did that for overwatch one right so yeah. they'll do yeah. it for Overwatch two i imagine i think they okay. said on the the reddit ama that uh they were like they imagined there would be some type of period like that Okay, let's get into some Overwatch League news. Is the uh, Plat Chat episode for today? We're wrapping up now? Exactly, Good yeah, we should be guys. wrapping up right yeah, now. We're done. That's it. Johnny <laughs> always tries to end these episodes early because he just wants to go drink. But... When was the last time I asked to end an episode early? And yes, that is the case. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> he Kurt, Discord Kurt, how many me. times has Johnny like, oh, can we change the recording? I have to go out to dinner. Or I got some exclusive party I got to be at. Like, and... Yeah, me, Jonathan's me always and Josh, with We're the super dedicated because we have nothing going on in our lives outside of esports. Vast, hey, you're so dedicated. We're missing show. like four shows in like two months. Just go, going away, working your typical office job. We're forced to fill in with like Jaws. I love Jaws. I wish we had Jaws more often. Get rid of yeah. Matt. I mean, yeah, those, those episodes, episodes, Jaws, those episodes you're a little of Jaws wagey show now. So uh, <laughs> today, uh, you guys should comment. Should we get rid of Matt from Flat Chat? <laughs> That, oh, it, it, that's oh, a this good will comment, be more, actually. This will be more Whoa. divisive than 5v5. I go back I mean, to the amputee analogy. That's I try to Okay. Dreamer got signed to the Outlaws. I believe. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I want to be very clear. My phone's run out of battery. And so just keep firing up these lower thirds as we, as we come off. I think the next one was Dreamer joins the Outlaws. I think that, that was correct. the next topic. Um, 
This confused me, I'm not going to lie, because also when we watched the Outlaws play, he was mostly playing ball for them, if I remember correctly. Ball and Winston. And Jangu plays both of those both characters. Both of those heroes. And okay, Jangu maybe hasn't had the most experience in the world on Winston, and Dreamer was shown that he was good. But I, I figured if Dreamer's going to join this team, it's because he's playing Orisa, because that's something that Jangu, I've never seen him really play. But... No, Outlaws are not playing double shield in this manner. Well, Instead, uh, they're playing Ball and Winston comps without Jangu, he, who look good. When he got signed, I thought he was just going to be like a backup, like almost like, oh, well, if we need him, great. If not, and then he played like almost every map this week. <laughs> it's like, uh, what? There was I mean, one, literally uh, played one game map, they took they? him out. No, oh, they took oh, him right. out. Uh, in one game, it's a die cast, so they took him out. And I think they put in uh they put in Jangu and they also put in Jake I think on that map. Oh yes, yes. Uh, no I remember that map. The first now. Yeah, series. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's where we got the, the jersey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an interesting one. What is what is the thought process with with Dreamer? I'm still confused. Honestly, I really can't tell you. I still don't know exactly what his like. I still don't know. Mm. I simply, like, honestly, I'm sure they have a reason for it because you can have another main tank and you can specialize them for certain areas, right? Mm. And, like, maybe this, this player is performing very well in scrims, right? We don't have the internal data, per se. Yeah. Um, but from the outside looking in, it is strange, essentially. Unless we didn't see enough of Jongu, like, because we didn't really see that much of no. Jongu's Winston. We right? only saw a small amount. And, like, we technically yeah. haven't seen Jongu's ball on the Overwatch League stage very much, if at all. Yeah, true, um, but he did play it a lot in content. And, and he was good at it. And he was good. He was good at it. And so uh, it's just a strange pickup. But Dreamer was good when he was in Overwatch League pre yeah. like last year. Yeah. Uh, and so, and he seemed, I'd say he looked kind of man his first appearance, but then they beat Mayhem. So, like, yeah. uh, overall, I don't know. I mean, I honestly, this seems like a coaching choice, a uh, staff choice to pick him up. And it's kind of just like, do you trust the coaches or not? That yeah. situation. Which they've done a good job so far in the season. Yeah. I don't, very hot. I, I don't understand it, but it's John it's fucking our show. Yeah. Oh. I think it's also because, like, it's the first time, like, the Outlaws, like, they had a fantastic stage. Like, the tank line was one of the things we were all excited about. Yeah. And then you just kind of, like, add a tank, and then Jungu's just kind of gone. And you're like, wait, what? It was yeah. so like abrupt and out of nowhere, I think. We did say, though, at the beginning of the season that May Melee, well, actually, what we thought was going to be Reinhardt, um, Reinhardt something compositions should have been Django and Piggy's best. Uh, th there are other yeah. things that they're good at, but they're very solid at those kind of rush based comps, um, whether it's Rein Zarya, Rein Diva, Rein uh, Sigma, whatever it is. And that ended up playing out. I don't, if at the beginning of the season, if you'd said, oh, they pick up Dreamer instead of Django, I think everyone would have been like, yeah, that makes sense. That actually does fill some of the holes that Django would be perceived to have. The only reason it doesn't make that much sense now is because we saw Django play Winston and it looked decent. I think that's yeah. the biggest reason why yeah. people are confused. Anyway, I, I'm just hoping that they play more Orisa comps because it seems like the meta is uh, trending in that way. direction from what I've seen Horse so far. Lady, yeah. um, okay, I can't remember what the next one was. I think it was about people retiring. Yeah. Uh, I think it was like Urster, Reprise, I mean, yeah, Shredlock. There, yeah. oh, yeah. there we go. There we go. I so I want to start here with Urster because he's one of my one of my favorite players that I in the small tiny amount of time that we got to actually see him play at at a top level. What a fucking weird career this guy has had. What an absurdly <laughs> strange career that Urster has had. He he starts he starts out by pounding the Pacific region and stuff. By playing with DM over on, I can't even remember what the team was called anymore, Ardeont and stuff. Just oh, yeah. rolling people around in the Pacific Division, winning big old bucks for himself, um, farming over there. Gets added into the league, gets benched for the Atlanta Reign, and then people, we, we were all questioning where the fuck has he gone. Uh, be, uh, Dogman's, uh, Dustin Bowman's talking later on about him not having the best work ethic did you guys see that episode i never saw that oh no i didn't see that on the dustin with two she t show the dustin with two t's he was talking to avril and avril mentioned about ursa and said that sometimes it's weird like people bench uh, players without the fans having any idea why and dustin went on a bit of a tangent where he was talking about um not either something about the work ethic or like how he integrated with the team and and like turning up to every scrim and bringing 100 percent it was somewhat vague because it felt like he didn't want to throw us to completely under the bus. 
But that seemed to be the internal dynamic within the team there. Mm. And so, okay, I had that in my head when I saw that he'd been announced as part of the Shanghai Dragons this year. And I was like, okay, well, one of the reasons that someone might have a perceived work ethic problem is because they just don't gel within a mixed roster team environment. Maybe they don't feel like all of their teammates are up to scratch, and so they shouldn't be bringing 100% if the other people are just letting them down anyway, or they can't get on board with the team communication, or they don't respect the coaches, or whatever the fuck it is. Those issues can sometimes be resolved if you just go and play with other people who have similar um, experience, language, and determination to succeed, and and a history of succeeding as well. And yet he just doesn't play a single time and then just decides to retire halfway through. What an absurd I mean, career. Th- this of a is, player this that is a player we were talking about. was a fucking boss. We were talking about him going into, uh, what was it, the fourth uh, season? We were like talking going into last year as him potentially being like an MVP candidate. And then he like doesn't even play. Uh, remember how good he was at the end of uh, the season? I think it was like... The end of 2019. He was either, yeah, he was yeah, 2019. Hanzo. He was yeah, Hanzo and Mary, and he was unreal. He was like the best at both of them. Uh, maybe you could have argued Corey was a little better at Hanzo, but Uster was fucking, fucking pounding. disappeared. He played a bit well, of May he, he looked kind of trash. Is there a possibility that he was like, you know... One of those like flash in a pants, or do we genuinely think he was really good but just like benched? The thing is though, Jonathan, he was amazing when he played in the tier two scene for years. And so I don't see how you can be a flash in the pan if you're like really, really good for a long period of time in tier two. Then you're good at the beginning of your Overwatch career, and then you fizzle out. Like you can't yeah, really be. A, I'm just asking. Because it's I'm not saying good. that. I'm just MVP asking. I don't know. He was MVP, he was MVP tier. For, for a short yeah, period of time. Yeah, I predicted him to be MVP in 2020. Look at that, that, how that went. He just. Yeah. yeah. I was on your page Ooh. as well. Yeah. But uh, so, I mean, uh, I will yeah, say that he competed for a spot with Fleta, who became the yeah. MVP. So I feel like my know. faith in this guy kind of was misplaced for some reason that I still don't understand why it was misplaced. I don't you know? think it is misplaced. I feel like it's not it's not unfair to think that this that Erster should perform. It's not unfair. It's yeah. Not, that's not that's not it's, it's really it's like I think it's not even an issue like personally like the Lanta Rain and Erster's benching and stuff like that there like that team was inherently dysfunctional. It was very dysfunctional. Yeah, sure. So I don't think like that was a very weird situation for any player to be in. Um in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, and they then, had the stuff with Daco in us in the yeah. same season. Oh uh, yeah, weird yeah. as well. It was. It was very weird. And Daco they, watch. Where was Daco? Daco was hiding in my closet the entire time. I kept him in there. I Daco. saw Daco. He was so drunk at the Atlanta homestand, but he was so funny. I like that guy. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of stories. Shout out to Daco. Said. Shout out to Daco. Daco is. How old was he at the time? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> nothing, uh, man, nothing. They, oh, and, I mean, and I like, don't know what we used to do. And then he went to Shanghai, and the, the, honestly, the competition for his spot grew tougher because he went to Shanghai, right? Mm. And also, yeah. there's a second complication where, like, his coach was Moon. And, like, this is not, like, a, me like saying, like, Moon's bad. It's more, like, Moon has a history, and we call it, like, the mother duckling theory, too, for coaches mm. often. But Moon, in particular, is, like, the queen mother duck. <laughs> and, then, like, every player he has worked with in the past, he is going to work with that player. He will travel across multiple continents. He will drop kajillions of dollars. It doesn't matter. He will blow apart a roster that was the attention to win the league. Trading fate for fearless. <laughs> yeah. I mean, technically, it was partially fearless's decision, right? Yes, like, yeah. But the thing is, is that like there, it seems tough to for I think for Ursa's situation, like to go from a situation where he was in a relatively dysfunctional team environment, then they go to Shanghai where. He, he, he hadn't played like he had played inconsistently and he's competing with very good players on a roster with a coach that has a history of prioritizing people that he prefers to work. Sure. You know, sure. Yeah, he's a mystery to me. If you if you ask me if I rather want God's be or Erster, I would have said Erster. And now I'm like, actually, would I have been wrong? Like, why is Erster not on a team? Thing. Like, and it could close. be something else yeah. internal, so, I don't know. Right? because like, it could. Dustin talked completely. about like we literally could be reading it entirely wrong because we don't have Absolutely. all the info. All right, yeah. Shredlock then. Shredlock is um uh, uh, oh I mean where does this leave the Vancouver Titans? Well, there's the rumor that they're getting Chongsik. But but where does it literally leave them? 
What do you mean? L like, if, I mean, that's just a rumor at the moment, isn't it? Well, it leaves them without a main tank. <laughs> yes, so. yeah, that's, they're they're that's, playing this upcoming weekend. <laughs> that's a pretty crucial position. That's yeah, like that a is. pretty weird situation to be. Well, They've already five franchised, five. so. What, sorry? They thought we were going to 5v5. Yeah, apparently. Dude. A little early. Um, Rio was ahead of the meta. Vancouver Titans ahead of the meta. Did he drop a twit longer? I, yeah, he I've did. no idea. I and he seemed very it. apologetic about it. Like his line was just like, sorry, before he oh, really? longer. Um, and in the case of the Vancouver Titans, like they've had a tough row of it, a row, uh, go of it, to say the least. And so Definitely. even if it's, you know, bad for a player to leave like a team like this, you know, we, we, we don't know if they've signed a main tank to replace him. They probably have. Like, he gave a heads up, most likely, right? Oh, yeah, but definitely. I'm just definitely. saying is, you can't get upset at Shredlock when, like, he's been part of this team now for, like, what, a year? It hasn't gone their way. It's incredibly mentally draining and exhausting to be a player and play so much and practice and try to get these wins and stuff like that. Like, at some point, mentally, I don't have any ill will for a player like retiring like this you know but, if they don't the want to continue playing just want to throw it out there again because people keep forgetting the vancouver titans have fucked their organization within the overwatch league repeatedly and uh i'm not saying that that is like directly a cause of what's going on here but they are not a team that's put effort into making sure that this roster succeeds and that does play out on the players because it puts them in like unwinnable circumstances where they're just in some Sisyphean hell. A lot of stress, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge amount of stress and you are constantly just put in a position to fail if you join a team like this because yeah. they're putting zero effort into, into putting their roster in a winning position ever since they kind of beefed their management of the runaway roster. So He's 19, he's going to hang out in Vancouver for a few months, go back to school. For sure, yeah. luck. He gave yeah, it a I'm go. Didn't Any have the, wasn't the best situation, but. Anybody who's this young has not wasted their time. Yeah. Because you can just yeah. go straight back into And you can take all the money you doing. earned, even if it wasn't like tons, as long as you weren't spending it all on the Linciaga shoes and stuff. And you can <laughs> use that money for a lot of different things, you know? All money. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't know. I mean, for me, it's more of like, woo, they gonna get, to, that's why the Chongzik rumor personally makes a lot of sense. Because mm -hmm. it's like, who the hell is going to go to the Titans? <laughs> like, and like, well, it's obviously going to be a main tank that hasn't played the game in two years. <laughs> Jonathan reinforce Larson. Like, no joke. That's why that rumor, I actually give the rumor a lot of credence simply because of the fact that like, they're not sending their best to the Titans. And I definitely yeah. think that like, it's tough to like attract talent to that team. And like, it is, yeah. Chonzik has not played for two years. How, um, how old are the guys from uh, Thingy? Oh, what the f I love that team. No, um, American Tornado. Yeah. Uh, most American of them, tornado? I think, are going to be of age at the end of this year. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe that they're. I think viable. they're end of Weren't age. Weren't they struggling yeah, with year. their tanks, though? What's oh, right? Didn't their tank retire? Uh, I'm going to be honest. I have not been keeping up with it. I just, I just remember that when I was doing some scouting of like tier two level coming into this season, they were clearly the best team, and they had a bunch of underage talent that looked pretty good, and they had like. The, the guy that's essentially like a PR disaster as well. So, yeah. Um, I've been putting out a shit ton of Overwatch League content, and that means that I cannot follow Tier 2 uh, at the same time because I am incapable of uh, having 36 hours in my day. Sorry. Yeah. Weird champion. <laughs> yeah, go on then. Tell us about them. Uh, oh, so yeah. Tell American us all about Tornado, your companion streams cool you do for Tier 2. Tornado is formed when a cold front <laughs> and a warm front meet okay. in the air differentials. Reprise. This is a. Uh, what, by the way, for anybody who's interested in learning more about the London Spitfire, Commander X keeps doing interviews with Yiska, and he's one of the most candid interviewee... Uh, interviewees? Candid... Yeah, yeah, yeah can, interviewees, yeah. yeah. One of the most candid interviewees that you'll get. Like, the guy is just straight up talking about, like, the, the stuff that they've been working through and how the coaching si uh, situation is differing and that kind of stuff. So if you're a London fan or you're just interested in how it works, then uh, check those out as well. They've been... Very useful for me to get an inside look into like what what the camp is actually doing over there. Wasn't uh, uh wasn't Fisher the coach of British Hurricanes? Yes. He was. He was also the coach of of Envy at one point, contenders, and he had and there's he's probably the only coach I know of that's had some sort of like weird departure from like a team. But that's a long time ago now at this point. So like who knows exactly what's going on? Just intra org drama. 
But it seems, I mean, ex-player coach, I've heard good things about Fisher. Yeah. From same. players. Mm. I've heard good things about Fisher as a coach. Uh, Reprise essentially just said, like, they weren't getting results and stepped down. Like, he didn't feel like he was, he yeah. didn't feel like he was accomplishing what he wanted. I can appreciate that as well. Like, I think knowing your limits is really important for just personal yeah. development and professional development as well. I think Reprise learned about how hard it is to be a head coach because he hadn't been like a head coach in Overwatch League before. Yeah. And there's a very, there's a long standing tradition of assistant coaches that have like pretty solid records or like resumes getting promoted to head coach and being like, oh my God. Yeah. This is way harder. And then also, be. some of them just kind of bluffing their way through it and running teams into the ground as a result. Who could that be? <laughs> not gonna, who could that not, be? Huh? Not gonna name names, but Reprise has not done that. So yeah, I yeah, think that's kind of cool. Players wanting their, other coach back in a way right well what do you mean? no fisher was always there as the coach he's just got a promotion oh he was still there okay gotcha yeah he was I, an I, assistant I, coach they had three coaches they had reprise as head coach and then they had uh fisher as a coach and um commander x as assistant coach as well and now they've just split out the roles a bit more between the two all right so yeah i mean just stepping aside i guess because i mean they haven't looked good this far really uh yeah you know how much is that on coaching but I mean, it's just absolutely brutal for London, though, because they're still, they're still not looking good to get a win until they play in, like, week 8 or week 11. It's actually, like, devastating. They're going to go half a season without getting a win. You know, London also yeah. now have the second highest loss streak in Overwatch League as a franchise. They haven't won a really? game in, like, like, 14, 15 games It's longer? 17. 17 I think games. It's, I think it might even games. be 17 yeah. or 18. And, like, point. it's looking at this oh point, they're going to... No one's going to be able to rival tide, er, Dragons. It's no. impossible to rival Dragons, but London looking like they're making a case for getting up there. <laughs> we had the longest loss streak, and then I forgot we had a team that went 0-40. <laughs> I mean, we had, literally had the worst sports team in the history of the world. <laughs> yeah, they lost. <laughs> they lost. I mean... There's, I mean, London are going to win a game eventually. Like, I, they just came in. Like, okay, I get it that they really sucked in main melee. But even, like, this week, they, they just a, came they in with the wrong okay composition. And so did the Washington yeah. Justice. So, like, you know, it was not... London Spitfire was not the only team that tried to play Winston this week and then realized that Double Shield was the best composition all along. They should have just listened to different analysts, you know? I mean, to be fair, I don't even think that's, like, totally, like, true. I just think they just played it exceptionally poorly. Like, you can pick any comp, and if you play it really badly, right, it's not going to go well for you. Like, you just need to pick a comp that's probably easier to execute. When you're in the Blizzard Arena Season 1, that's what everybody said about Shanghai. Oh, they'll win one eventually. Next thing you know, fucking 65 weeks later, oh my god. They to be fair, Shanghai I mean, was really close a couple times. Are you comparing the Lona Spitfire, the British Hurricane, the Tier 2 champions, to the Shanghai Dragons? I, I'd that's make that comparison funny. because it would make it really it would funny roll. <laughs> Season 1 Shanghai Dragons this league is way better than when season one shanghai dragons existed so yeah. what is the next topic mr curtis we don't know ah the atlanta rain so yeah we're going into our overwatch league recap from last week so wow the first one was the atlanta rain scrim bucks which i don't think is accurate really because the scrim bucks have gone extinct at this point I, good it's good they should remain dead they should be gone i don't mean i don't mean dead forever. in terms of people not buying into them i mean like the atlanta rain strip bucks were around them playing rush and this is this is a, a a different meta um although i guess there's some similarities in terms of the way they're playing but not not many particularly i was very impressed with the way that atlanta played this week i think that yep. they've really got a good idea of what they want to do and most importantly gator and hawk look a lot better than in previous I mean, betters, if we want to put it like that. They haven't it's, looked this good since, like... Gauntlet? Yeah, since they were in contenders, essentially. Yeah, I really think I so. mean, also, this is, like, the rise. Like, Pelican lived up to this, the hype this week. Yeah, yeah. Pelican deadlifted this team. Like, I know the rest yeah. of the team looked good. Pelican was doing things I hadn't seen a lot of Echo players do before. Like, it was, like, incredible what some of the Echo players were happening. This Like, a lot of these matches this week, I felt like, were determined by the Echo players. Um, yeah, when they've got yeah. mercy, mercy yeah. damage boost, and they've got potentially nanos coming up. And all Pelican, the time. Pelican popped the fuck off. Like yeah. that guy Wait. actually owned. The amount of times I saw Echoes nano this past weekend, and then it's just like hit or miss. Like they just nano an Echo and just didn't get anything, and was just total papeg. And then you'd nano an Echo, and they just kill like two, three people with a focusing beam, and you'd be like, oh, you know, obviously you just nano the Echo every time. Like <laughs> it, your Echo determines actually so much. It's yeah. ridiculous, but it's very entertaining as well. 
Because in some of these matchups, I don't know if it was this one, it was the other Atlanta Rain one. Um, against Elono Spitfire. No, which map am I thinking about? But anyway, like when you see two really good echoes just go against each other, they build the ultimate charge so fast that you they just duplicate like every fight and they just fly around and they're just like use their abilities and sticky bombs, you know, focusing beam. Then you duplicate to a diva, you throw a self destruct, and then you become a Winston and you primal and it's just chaos. I actually love it. It's it's echoes overpowered. I'm gonna enjoy it while it lasts because it's really fun to watch. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, it, she is not going to stay like this forever. It just is not viable for the game long term because she's she's absurdly powerful, absurdely. Yeah. But it is yeah. fun at the, for the for a short period of time. Also, metas won't even allow it to. Like, it's tough for Echo to get this much value when you can't play a rush to just for you. Sure. Like, it's a lot harder to play Echo to like get that much value. So the meta is helping a bit with Echo being so strong. Who are the yeah. other teams that you think have been on a similar kind of wavelength to Atlanta? Because to me, they have really stood out as like a team that the looks most improved oh, team, damn probably. Good. Yeah, they would dominate APAC. I watched all the APAC matches except for one. They would dominate that. I feel APAC like APAC is far behind in this meta. Yeah. Oh, I was yeah. watching some they're of the games and these... they just yep. they feel like I feel like they're stuck to their old ways. Mm -hmm. uh, we we have a few teams that haven't played yet. Uh, what the shock haven't played yet this stage? Yeah. Gladiators Dallas haven't, haven't played. Gladiators, played. Dallas, neither of them. Gladiators, yeah. Um, I don't Soul know. Hasn't I mean, like, this composition really, played. really facilitates your DPS players, and this is what we talked about going into the season. Or oh, well, what I, I actually didn't talk about it too much because I actually said that they were a bit overrated. But Kai and Pelican, if you can just fa facilitate their performances and make your composition centric around those. This is what, like, uh, an Arisa Diva does. And then with a BAP as well, with a Mercy. Like, you really just want value from either Pelican or from Kai. No. And they are the perfect men to do it because they slap on their individual roles. So I feel like this is a really good meta for the Atlanta Reign. Now, they, I don't think they faced a lot of composition this past weekend. I don't want to overrate them too much. But they are definitely a candidate to win the entire June Joust if this composition is going to be it, if it's going to be the meta, because they're really good at it. W yeah. Would it be weird for me to say Houston? Like, once they adjusted to playing more Arisa, obviously not in this series, but, like, they looked really strong. I mean, Dante's Echo's fucking sick, and they it have Happy good, as yeah. well. He's really strong in the hit scan. where I feel like this could be pretty decent for the Outlaws. Like, pro maybe not as good as, you know, the main melee, but... I think they can still be a contender to make it out of uh, knockouts and go to Hawaii at least. What did you guys think about the the Houston Outlaws across this week in total? Because I think it's easy to like. Well, uh, let's let's start there. the The second time around, do you feel like that's a trajectory, like a trend in the right direction, or is that kind of variability in how they're performing this week? Because I felt like the first time we watched them, it wasn't just based on comps. It was also like players being fielded in certain situations. Like, I, honestly, I don't really understand why Jake was in. Well, in Jake the, in had some a long, Coach Jake had a long talk with player Jake. Okay, you're right. It wasn't the right move. <laughs> right. Because so. I don't exactly understand that move. Like, I don't think he looked great when he played the Mercy. I think he died pretty much every time first. Like, almost every single yeah. fight. He, he just looked really uncomfortable there. Like, it wasn't a, an area that he had expertise in. What do you think overall of this Houston Outlaws? Like, I guess my core point is... Was their main melee performance an overperformance for the season overall? Or is it... What, what's your meta early thoughts? It's a good meta. I, I think they'll be fine throughout the season. I, I think they definitely... Well, what I, would, what I like to see from teams is that you know, they just don't go out there and just face palm the same, uh, just fucking face plant the same composition after they lose into the next team and just see like, oh, well, you know, let's just run it again. Like we actually saw adjustments from the outlaws, uh, as opposed to just doing the same thing and losing again. Uh, so I think that's obviously a great sign. And then them being able to adjust on the fly and play that to a high enough level to beat the mayhem who were good enough to make it out, uh, of our last qualifier i i think that's a pretty good sign for the outlaws um i think it's really kind of like de dependent on what we see from you know gladiators and shock uh right, right. I, I think if we see the gladiators play like you know pretty lifeless uh you know who who plays like uh echo and whatnot for the shock uh i, th I think there's a lot of different questions uh 
uh, with those teams that, yeah, maybe the Outlaws can remain as strong in NA. Am I Is going the... to be the one to say it? Go on then. Yeah, say it. I think that the Houston Outlaws, I think they have a really good roster. Dante and Happy, of course, like fantastic DPS duo. Wondering what they're doing now with like Dreamer and Jangu, and they're going to figure out their main tank role. Piggy has been fantastic so far. Crimso is really proving himself. But, but. I love you, Jake. And I, I really enjoy talking to you. You're so versatile. You're, you're, you're really, you know, knowledgeable about the game. But game this whole main support <laughs> situation feels like such a major crutch to this team. Like, wouldn't you just want a really good, stable main support player? This feels so unnecessary, what they're doing with Joby and Jake. Because, like, you have Jake subbing in with Mercy on this one, and it was okay, but, like, it was not great. If you have, like, a really good roster, if your DPS duo is Dante and Happy, I don't think putting, like, your assistant coach Jake on Mercy as your solution does the rest of the roster justice. So I actually think Jobis Lucio during May Melee was actually like a positive surprise. And yeah, Jobis yeah. Lucio was like, you know, good. But when they're playing Mercy, when they're playing Brig, I don't, I, I don't like the current main support situation that they have going on because they have such a good roster overall that it sort of feels disrespectful to the rest of the roster. And I realized, okay, that they, you know, they're, they're still beating teams. Um, you know, for example, like beating the Florida Mayhem, that's a nice achievement. They did it, you know, with the Jake, Drake Rat as well. So, you know, you got to give credit to them. Their record so far this regular season is is good. Um, and, you know, May Mela, they looked really strong. But long term, if you want to win like tournaments and you want to win like end of season uh, playoffs, I think that you need to figure out your main support situation. And honestly, like just having a more well-rounded, better player is like, the, the the like straightforward answer really rather what, what, than trying what's the to answer like there, then is the answer teaching juby brig or is the answer picking up another player or is the answer jake just learning how to play every support well like, what which I of mean, the three would I you want to go with your roster is already good now so to me it would be to pick up like a good main player at this point now you know i'm not gonna say that i know who to pick up and etc but they went into joby you know going into this season so they could have you know, done. They could have gone with like a fantastic, well-rounded main support from the start because in the preseason you had options. You know, but sorry, I don't know what you said there. Could have gone with Toby. Could have gone with Toby. Toby. I mean, I'm Toby. just saying. They actually might not. I'm just saying. I'm reasons, worried but... about this. If you're, if you have yeah, a I'm really sick it, yeah. roster now, and I'm worried about this situation you're dealing with with the main support because yeah, yeah. there is no, there is no like. We don't know how this is going to work out. You're essentially betting on that Juby will learn how to play Mercy and Brig to an elite tier level, or you're just going to have your assistant coach Jake flex into that role and sometimes play Junkrat like he's the Western equivalent of Violet, um, just like playing main support <laughs> and Junkrat yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And I don't think that like does the rest of the roster justice. Like You could be better, but I don't know. It feels really rude and disrespectful. <laughs> But I feel like it it has to be said. I mean, but the I mean the coaches all agreed on it. <laughs> so the coaches all agreed yeah, on it. Yeah, coaches, I mean, they all did. They all met together. Jake agreed to play Jake. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I yeah. mean I think it was fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um yeah. I mean personally I, <laughs> I will never get old of that. That that joke is the funniest shit in the world to me, by the way. <laughs> Every time Jake plays, like, well, the coaches thought it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. And then also, by the way, remember I had a rant about this earlier in the season about yeah, how I yeah. think it's inherently a co giant conflict of interest when your assistant coach is trying to be a player? Yeah. I think it is. I still think it is. I still have that opinion. They could have perfect intentions, but it's still going to get fucked up because, like, you think Jake's ever going to say, like, obviously Jake himself will tell you, like, I'm not always going to try to play. Like, I will try to do what's best for the team. Yeah. But at the end of the day, he's going to do some thinking with his dick. And he's like, I want to play. <laughs> and like, and so I, to me, I 100% agree. And I had the exact same opinion for me. I think the May Melee was actually, I don't think it was an overperformance for this roster. The roster is really good. And they have a great coaching staff, honestly. Like I have, yeah. despite of what I think of like Jake's support play, he's a really smart guy. Oh, yeah. He has a good grasp of the game. He's like understands multiple roles. Um, and you got and junk, and junk bug, you know, and like yeah. Yeah. you have a really great support staff there and a great roster. But the reality is, their main support situation is tragic. 
It is a current tragic position for this team to be in with their level of play, and it only worked out so well because Juby has a good Lucio. Juby has a really good Lucio. He has a Lucio that can compete at the top level, um, and that's what he's known for. But like, also, I'm not even big on the Jake Brigida either. No, I think I Jake got exposed right. on the Brigida heavily. Um, he had some of the same mistakes he was making when he was playing Goats Brigida yeah. during this week, um, and playing like mega aggressive and getting caught in times. Like, uh, so the, the the reality is this main support situation is not good for them for the long term. Uh, and no. there's a it could work out where like Juby either learns a lot more heroes or maybe Jake. Well, it's not a lot more though, is it? It's really just the just brig, mercy, isn't it? It's more. It's mercy too. Yeah. Mercy. I, I swear he's played the mercy though. For not them, not nearly as much he? as Lucio. Not nearly as much as Lucio. He has played mercy, but his mercy hasn't looked great either. If you, he's played mercy for this team, it hasn't looked amazing. It's the Jakes though, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, uh, mechanically, yes. Decision making wise, possibly also yes. But like, maybe, I mean, maybe not in terms of what the calling and what what yeah, else Jake brings like to the team. Yeah, there's a lot of intangibles. Sure. Give, and Jake also can flex to the Brigida, right? So yeah, like, yeah. there are things that Jake provides, um, but it still doesn't change the fact that I wouldn't describe him as top tier. I wouldn't describe Juby as top tier or anything other than Lucio currently. Uh, and that's a huge issue with this team <laughs> yeah. right now. So I don't know where they're going to go. I don't know how they're going to fix this uh, exactly. And I feel like they've committed to something that is they they didn't realize what Pandora's box they've opened. I, I even wonder if, if Jake knew how to play Lucio at a decent level, if he would just play it all the time. I mean, the that's the thing. He might around. be. And that's why it's, it, to me, this, this experiment is bananas fundamentally I think, flawed i think this entire endeavor by houston is bananas and i i wasn't a fan of it from the beginning i'm recorded and obviously it does not matter if everyone goes in with great intentions because eventually we end up with the jersey <laughs> the jersey i love that name um since i want to ask you guys sorry oh, quickly sorry, five seconds since you're ranting so much of us about how you didn't like this from the get-go i'll just like to pinpoint in that same recording i actually said that this would happen <laughs> and it yeah. did happen so yes i we uh, saw this coming but yes go on Saicho. Saicho, yeah yeah i i wanted to um i wanted to ask people a question about the meta as well what what direction do you guys think the meta is going in for the june joust because to me the arisa diva comps seem extraordinarily good and versatile and it feels like they're extremely hard to deal with on when they are attacking what the yeah they pressed that? the button there oh right i can't remember that happened in life um what what direction do you think the meta is going in because avas you said earlier that you don't think this is necessarily the way like the best comp to play you can play a range of different things if you want to play them properly what what's your thoughts on where we're headed for the june joust well what, my th what I think is possible is very different than what right? Okay, all right. I think there is still a huge variety of possibilities, but the reality is with all Overwatch things, with everything ever, we trend towards the most simple. Okay. And it is far simpler to play double shield and have a lot of cover for your Mercy and like your BAP or whatever you're playing with and like play around the double shield and the halt switch than it is to execute like a really good dive currently or right. even the rush. Because also, I have argued, I argued with Albert over this, and I don't care. I don't care if the world's against me on this one. I despise the reaper echo rush comp that team's been playing mm. with that moira lucio i hate it yeah. yeah i hate it i hate that comp i think it's completely non-synergistic and it's it works out because it is the closest shape to a rush we can get yeah, but it is yeah. a square shaped wheel I, yeah, yeah. And okay i casted some shit this weekend uh that was so so fucking weird it was uh arisa sigma with the Reaper, Echo, Moira, Lucio. God, I, I hate it. I, I was like, it. what in the world is this? And the team got spawn camped. I forgot who it was. Uh, I mean, they, they were just getting rolled. But like, you seen some weird shit. It's I, just not a good meta. I just don't like that meta. I don't like that. I think okay. Arisa, uh, Arisa plus Sigma, Arisa plus Diva are both good. I thought we would see teams fuck around with Roadhog a bit, kind of like how we saw in the playoffs. Sort of little, but, but but again, it just seems to be really difficult to play into an well, Arisa it's comp good, it's good. You, you can do shield it versus the dive. Face. You can do it because since yeah. we can't play stare, we can't play the typical rush. You can sort of play it now because it's very easy to keep your Reaper alive when you're when Echo is on the field and you have a Moira and you keep you have like you know like there's there are there are options to deal with it, but like it's definitely. The easiest comp to execute currently, it seems, is the double shield with like the Hanzo and the Mercy and mm. such. But I don't believe that is the meta solution. I just believe that is like the easiest comp to execute. And so it's going to gain a lot of favor. I, um, you can draw some lessons from APAC. I, uh, I'm cashing in my smog box from last week. 
I okay. said it was going to be double shield, and I think it's still going to be double shield. I just think it's too difficult for Winston's to dive. Um, I feel like they get exposed against these kind of compositions. I will say, though, that if you take a look at APAC, they're playing some interesting stuff. Now, Shanghai, they still play this, like, Mercy, Echo kind of thing, where they just, like, put everything into Fleta um, and try to get value out of their Echo. I don't think that's necessarily going to work either um, against these double shield comps. But Hangzhou, and I mean, this is actually one of the topics later, so we're just jumping ahead. But they play a variation of this, which is like Winston Reaper. But they don't play the Lucio Moira. Um, they play the other sports, which I can't remember right now. But they play, a, they, they play almost like a Winston Reaper brawl, um, which is way more about like poking away the tanks, just like poke away enemy Winston Diva. Um, you play this brawl comp. But then with the Reaper teleport, you can actually dive if you want to um, as Shao well. And Ash still. Yeah. Do they play like? Earth so you can like peel for uh, Shy. You can peel for Shy with a Reaper, which is like kind of effective. They they actually have a team identity, so it's kind of not. What are the Shai supports? Fox. They play like Ana. Yeah. Uh, I think we're at the support the Spark uh, topic. At, at yeah. This story Kurt. By the way, it's I've I've completely lost control because again I don't. I don't have any, I, I, I have no idea what our topic list was, but let's, let's talk about the spy for a little while because, dude, I, I'm, I'm loving watching Shy. I'm just yep. loving it. Like, play him in whatever comp, force him in. Yeah, sure, play him with a Reaper, Fucking whatever. Own. Shy is so fun to watch. He's got such an explosive style. It, it, I don't know, it just takes me back to 2018. So the, the support, just to clarify, the support they play is Brigana. So yeah, they play very no. compact, like they would have a McCree, and they just protect Shy, but with a Reaper, so they can teleport to be aggressive or just peel. Yeah, it's cool. Sorry I'm about that. This team. Why? <laughs> because remember I said, remember my preseason rankings? By the way, my preseason rankings are looking powerful currently. Really? They are looking powerful. Minus Chengdu. Atlanta um, doing real well. But I saw Atlanta relatively high. I just oh, didn't did have you? Super high. Right, right. Um, but like Justice, remember, everyone mauled it out of control when I said I didn't think Justice was going to be that good. They were my dark horse pick to fail. Ooh, yeah. I'm looking so good. They mauled it over control. I'm going to hold on to that. I can hold on to every comment stored inside me like an energy <laughs> source. But the point being, I'm pissed because I had Spark really high. And you guys were like, Spark high? What? Well, no, no actually, you did not. I, I no. wanted Spark High. No, the others shot no, me down. No. Yes, I did. No. I, I was the Spark fucking I fan believed boy. in Spark. And then they pulled out this Papige all the time. They were Papigean back and forth. Yeah. And now they finally put in Shy. They finally got to a Winston meta. They I am still so are not happy playing, that like, you predicted that they were going to play Bernard instead, instead of Ligue <laughs> and that they were going to play MCD now instead to be of fair, Now, I to mean, be fair, I did not predict that. I, did predict, <laughs> I think that still made them worse. I, I did predict that. Yeah, I think if they were playing Ligue and they were playing like... Uh, <laughs> If they were playing like their other, I, I would still the, rather coldest. have like yeah, coldest, coldest, coldest. yeah, coldest exactly. Like I still think they're not playing their perfect roster here, but I think they're essentially going through their evolutions like Cell in Dragon Ball Z, and they're gonna find it. They're gonna find it, and they're gonna pop Shanghai, off. By the way, and like I think that I think Spark. That's why I'm pissed about mostly. It's just I, I eventually said I said last week I was like I'm never gonna predict this team because like I didn't think like I was like they'll probably be fine, but I don't think they're gonna be great. I don't think they're gonna beat Shanghai ever, and they immediately. <laughs> immediately. Yeah. Yeah, they okay. actually have a team identity. This is what I love about this team because I watched all the APEC matches. And like all the other teams, they're like trying to figure out, you know, they try to play this Echo Mercy thing. But Hangzhou Spark, they have a team identity. They look like they're all on the same plan. They're synergized. It's actually kind of nuts. Like they've won 2 0 and they have two winnable matches coming up in APEC. This team is going to be in the knockout matches and potentially be in the June Jouse playoffs. They look like one of the more well structured teams in the APEC region. It's unbelievable. You see such different teams at the end of the June Joust, by the way, like with the way things are shaking out. Yeah, yeah. But vastly different. I mean, a lot of the top teams from the main melee have taken a bit of a nosedive, but it's also early days, right? It's like we're still figuring out what the meta is and trying to solidify and it. And we still haven't seen half the top team. Yeah. With like Alice. Yeah. Oh, uh, Vass, could you speak into the mic more, please? Oh, my bad. I always <laughs> lean far away and Kurt's yelling at me, so... Um, Take what the was, mic off it's the mostly thing. when you like turn your head to Josh. What what the heck was some of our um <laughs> was some of our topics that we skipped over? Uh, oh, oh. The next topic is Philadelphia Fusion's honeymoon ends. No, sure. wait, you skipped ahead now, did you not? 
Austin Uprising Redemption arc. We never oh, talked about justice. All right. All right. Decay goes missing from the Washington Justice. The Washington Decay Justice. Decay goes missing from the Justice. I, when I watched the Justice games, this was not my big takeaway, though I know that this will be a big community takeaway. Is this actually, I want to start there. Is this a big community takeaway? I haven't been oh, keeping yeah. my finger on the pulse. Yeah. Are people molding? Oh, yeah. People are molding. Yep. People were adding me during my stream. And they're, they remember they did a watch party. They had right. a watch party for Justice. Oh, and so yeah, their they're first in, ever they're watch party. They're in the facility, right? And next to like the open area they're doing it, there's the player rooms. So people were like taking pictures of the player room like window trying to see and it's like where's Decay? Where is he? Like trying to lift up the blinds like where's Decay? That is some weird and, like, shit. They could have and then he and then the best part is he came out and did the fan signings afterwards everything, right? Yeah. So he was there. Oh wow. Yeah. So I uh, the, my biggest takeaway though from watching the Justice games was not they don't have Decay. It's this team is not functional. This team no. is slow as balls and they tried to do that during the main melee. And it was still biting them in the ass when they were doing it then. And now they're doing it here. And they just give, they give to enemy teams too much respect, too much time. They don't have the killer instinct to be able to close out team fights properly. And they just, I don't know. They don't have that go button to be able to actually coordinate together. To be and fair, play aggressively Naga in this match also had the utility. best echo performance I've ever seen in Overwatch League. I mean, it was insane. Yeah. This, like, this legitimately, Naga was not only the best echo player, but the best D.Va player in yes. this server <laughs> is the one he played. Yeah, the so, D.Va was phenomenal as well. It was actually crazy. Out D.Va Fury. But I, I just felt like this is one of the teams that hasn't found their identity and also is really struggling to, in general, find a good identity. They, they The best thing that they played was the Winston comps, and they didn't even play them the best in the league. When... When you've got a team like this, you should be fucking popping on Winston Diva comps. And they just... They Fury looked... I'm going to say it. Fury looked bad. Fury didn't look good. I'm going to say it. Fury... Sure. Fundamental... Like, we were watching it. We were watching... There were so many times... Part of the reason Naga actually owned is because Fury almost never marked or peeled the Echo. He just let Naga do whatever he wanted. Yeah. All the time. And that's why Ellie Boat actually had a much better performance comparatively because Ellie Boat was at least zoning Assassin and like trying to like take pressure off his tanks and, and like and his supports. Fury, like this is one of the few times you can say that like Fury looked not good. He didn't look and but it wasn't like Fury's mechanics are bad, right? It's like he just didn't understand what he was supposed to be doing. Yeah. I, I thought the same of Mag actually during this series too. When I was watching him, I was like, what what like when I'm watching him during a team fight, I'm like, what do you think your purpose is here? Because he doesn't, he, he doesn't feel like he has... It just feels like the whole team doesn't exactly know what they should be doing at yeah. any point. Like, what parts of the map they should be fighting over, what their timing should be, how do they synergize together on, like, diving certain people or which people to pressure out of positions. They just don't quite get it. They're just kind of milling around, hoping the Jerry... You probably watch play more, kills. Josh. Uh, does Mag play any Orisa? Like, we haven't seen them do anything but these Winston comps this entire stage thus far. And Orisa did not get played in Contenders Korea very much yeah, from what I can I, remember. If I remember properly, Mag did not... Even when I was casting him, I don't remember Mag ever playing Dude, Orisa. I have no idea. I mean, so... it's the same for, like, Jangu as well. It's not necessarily that they can't play them. It's just... I can't remember a time when it was meta that I would have seen them play against good teams. So I don't have an image in my head. I don't have a memory of like, oh yeah, I thought they were X good when they played in a Arissa meta. It was like, when the fuck even was that? When was the last Arissa meta? I guess the last like, Arissa meta was Summer Showdown, but that was yeah. wasn't that with some kind of hero pool? Or, oh no, that was it with a patch. There was a patch, and there was probably staggered hero pools too. I can't remember exactly. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I uh, not Me? that I'm aware of though. I don't know how good he is. Yeah, we have, so, I mean, if, but like you mentioned, even their Winston comps, like, they, I mean, they didn't show anything else, right? But, I mean, they just looked tragic, uh, where, I mean, I, I think Decay would make an impact. Uh, does it change them? What, maybe they win a map that, but they still would have lost both these series. I mean, they, and they also, just got... Decay would have covered up the holes. He wouldn't have fixed the team. He would have just clutched fights they should have lost. That isn't that isn't fixing the root of the problem. That's just putting a patch over the top of it and being like, eh, fuck yeah. it, we'll kind of muddle our way through. That's okay. That's not what you want, I don't think. So I, I will preface this by saying that I am a Washington Justice apologist, okay? okay. I have invested heavily into the Washington Justice, and therefore okay. it is my, um, you know, obligation to defend them as well. Um, they also make good beer. Please send me more beer. I ran out. <laughs> um, but the point being, okay, I, I am a bit of an apologist here, but the thing with the K is, 
it's not that he's like a 10, you know, 15, 20% upgrade over Jerry, like whatever. You know, I think what you, you hit the nail on the head earlier. It, it, it's a team that is not functioning, okay? Like structurally, they seem lost, okay? Like they, they, like, first of all, you could say that they don't understand the meta. Like they don't understand how to play the echo meta and closer pocketing assassin and like investing in assassin and how does mag and fury facilitate that um and how do you combine that by pocketing jerry um they might not understand the meta but when you have structural problems like this in teams if i was a coach i could i would say that there would be a difference if you put in a star player like decay it's not so much that he's like 10 percent better than jerry it's that, that like the rest of the team rallies around him and that he has he becomes like this central figure within the team who can be clutch turn fights around also like the team is not is not worried about who is stepping up for decay they're not worried about like hey i need to have an impact because we're not, not like playing with decay they're like way more relaxed and calm it's like hey we have decay popping off he's gonna do that thing and i can just do my task my job as a, a diva player my job as a wrecking ball or a winston player like i just focus on that and decay will figure out the rest so i could definitely see it in some teams and i'm not saying necessarily washington justice but in general if you have structural issues with your team it could definitely be the case that each individual is trying too hard um to solve an issue that necessarily isn't there and that's where it can be very comforting I mean, Avast might just shut me down there. Like, I'm talking bollocks. I'm just talking about, like, fucking ancestral, like, I don't know. It's like, what, what do you call the, the, the star signs? A zodiac signs? Zodiac. Whatever. Zodiac. It, zodiac. it feels yeah, like I'm yeah. talking about zodiac signs here when it comes to team building and team performance. Yeah, the but horoscopes. I, I, the horoscopes. But I do think that having a star player like Decay could be very comforting for the rest of the team and have an increase on their individual performance by themselves. Were you so, comforted yet, by Striker? Well, I wasn't playing, so it didn't matter for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so but, I yeah, know. I do think subbing in Decay could actually make a difference I mean, for the it's, it's team as a whole. It's an intangible that's tough to be measured, right? Without people talking about it. Cool. Would exactly. you say that the Dallas Fuel were comforted by Decay last year? Probably not. Mm, no. So, like, the thing is, is that it really just depends on the situation. And, like, I don't, I, I, can't, I can't refute or agree with Johnny because I don't have the info. That's how I feel, in a way. That's my feelings. Is the okay. K in the room right now? No, but those are my feelings. Fair enough. Uh, the Boston Uprising did pretty well this week. Speaking of uh, Avast's former career, uh, this... I love a career. You do, but that was a different career. That's so true. that makes different it your life. former career. Different life. Um, the Boston Uprising did pretty damn well. I feel like this is a much better representation of their genuine talent than the main melee was. I feel like they got off to a slow start there. And this is kind of true Boston uprising, what we're witnessing right now. Again? I gotta go look at it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this was a team that, even though they were sh shit in the May Melee, we knew they weren't going to be bad the whole season. Have they like, not uh, played since it, week three? Well, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I was, I was reading that wrong. I thought we were on week eight. I, 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 my eyes aren't working. Um, knew this team wasn't going to be bad the whole year. Uh, we knew eventually they were going to click, right? Uh, I, I think, obviously, the May Melee wasn't the best for them. They get Gil Bolsi, uh in. But I also think when you looked at this team, like, I didn't really feel that Punk was, like, the issue they were losing. Like, I don't think he was particularly bad. Uh, I'm not, well, I, I may be surprised in the fashion in which they're winning, like, looking really, really strong, but I'm not surprised they are winning. Like, I think this is a team that, we expected to be about middle of the pack in NA could potentially shoot up a little bit higher and upset somebody, which is kind of how they look right now. Yeah, I didn't actually expect them to be middle of the pack. I thought their peak would be more like middle of the pack. But um, but yeah, yeah, I think also they've benefited from playing against two teams that are in a bit of a struggle right now like toronto to me and actually they've played toronto and washington right those were their games for this week yes and yeah. both of those teams despite the fact they have excellent match win records have never really given off the vibe of excellent team to me yet so far this season i think they're both four yeah. and one or something aren't they yeah four and one four and two they have really good records and yet they have never looked like the best teams in the league they've just been able to get by and I think that Boston, while these wins are really, really good for them, 
Um, I think these were winnable opponents, right? I don't think that Boston's then going to go on and just start smashing everybody in the June joust. I could be wrong about that, but they 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 feel like they're getting very solid wins over um, over decent opponents, but not like not unbelievable opponents. I don't know what yeah. I'm trying to say here. I'm just no, no. I mean, you're just I, arguing I mean, think their schedule. Yeah, but it's more like. I feel like Toronto and Washington both don't quite get the meta right now. And that's given Boston a bit of an advantage because they, they at least understand what their purpose should be in these comps. Yeah. I mean, to me, they are the epitome of a dark horse team. And this is what I said about going into the season. I'm not going to say that they're a dark horse in terms of like they're underrated and they're actually going to be a lot better than people expect. I just think that they look at, at their roster and the fact that they have previous team synergy, having played in contenders, most of these guys together. I just feel like they have potential to get ahead of some teams like the Toronto Defiant, a struggling Washington Justice, capitalize on them being like injured animals in the wild who's like can't figure out the a meta and just get ahead of those teams. And that could also upset some of the stronger teams um, because they have the individual skill to back it up. So um, yeah, I mean, I think this is what I expected from the Boston Uprising going into the season where it's like they can get some of these wins against struggling teams uh, during meta shifts. Um, or straight up just like surprise teams, um, better teams, if they're caught unaware by how good the Boston Uprising really are. I don't think, you know, Boston Uprising are going to be the next big thing in the league, but this is what they're capable of. So they're finally like showing, you know, that they're not and a roster to overlook. They certainly have the skill in a lot of these positions. Like overall, it's a solid, complete roster. I'm a, I thought this is the map. I thought this is the fight they threw. Mm. My bad. That's <laughs> my bad. I thought this is the fight they threw. I, um... I'm going to be honest, my, I'm taking it. I'm, I'm on the, I'm essentially like how Johnny is for justice. I'm feeling that way for Defiant right now. So what you're simping for him. No, I'm not simping for him. I, no. well, I was simping for him. I just, <laughs> my, um, my, I've just taken a deep hit. From oh, my Defiant right. belief uh, oh. currently. Uh, but Boston actually legitimately, I think, well, also I think the big, we're overlooking one of the most important things here. Valentine doesn't have to play Tracer for this team anymore. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And Valentine's Tracer <laughs> was atrocious. It was yep. legitimately, considering what a caliber of player he was rumored to be, that Tracer was so bad, I would have preferred anything else. Literally anything yeah. else. But also, they were supposed else. to have soon. Right? They were. So they were. Exactly, that, but that doesn't change the fact that Valentine's Tracer was bad, right? Yeah, Dude, but, so, but it does change the fact that he wasn't expected to play it. It's not yeah, fair to yeah, rate yeah, him. Yeah, but that's why I'm saying that the hero pools changed. We're kind of missing the fact that the hero pools changed affected them greatly because yeah, yeah. now Valentine actually has an impact on, sure. the, on to be the game. Fair, to be fair, I do want to have it noted that... Uh, that, that is the argument I made last week, and I 100% agree. His trace was bad, but I would also have agreed with you last week that Valentine's Echo in May Melee was not good. He did not oh, yeah. live up to expectations in the May Melee. So yeah. the fact that he actually improve, improved on his Echo and looked better this week, arguably against two very bad teams, I would say that's a good sign in the right direction for, sure. for the Boston Uprising, yeah. that Valentine could actually live sure. up to the potential we were promised going into the season. I also think that, um, stand, uh, you know, I also think that stand one for me, it kind of overperformed on Winston here a bit. Uh, I think stand one's Winston was actually a lot better than I was expecting. It's not that stand one. I actually think people always underrated Standall, as I call him. I call him the Standall. Standall. Uh, but Standall. I think people Twinkle. always underrated him a bit, but I actually historically thought his Ryan was his best hero. Um, yeah, shockingly, when he was playing in contenders, I think yeah, I would have. Uh, agreed with that. And yeah. so I wasn't expecting his Winston to be that good. Uh, so this was a big thing for me too. And then finally, I know P I know Matt, you didn't think that Punk is a problem for this team, and I agree. I didn't think he was a problem, but I think Gable She is so much better that it's kind of unreal. I mean, also yeah, well, on this for sure. This team can now calm in Korean. I think yeah, and they can. That's yeah. the other, I was about literally about to bring that up, and that's a good point. Is that they can calm in Korean? It's and gotta make that's a difference. Huge. It has to. It's huge. It literally like the the thing is historically, if we look over time, by the way, almost generally over time, every team uh has gotten better with. A more clear generally with like becoming like like take it for example justice mixed roster full korean now obviously you could argue the players are way better too but yeah. performing way better defiant like granted they were full korean at one point pretty bad they yeah. went mixed worse they went back to korean i'd <laughs> say they're better now um i think generally communication is an extremely strong thing and yeah. it's just having the ability to comment all korean is going to help this yep. and i think i Gable know G how to is just a better toronto player. defiant though What's, What's that? 
I know how to fix Toronto. Yeah. Okay, tell me. Tell me, fucking please. Gather up all the fucking two liter Coca Colas that these players have gathered because everybody's fucking got one now. <laughs> and you put them in a fucking a fridge and you put a big lock on it. And you, 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 unless they win, nobody gets two liter Coke anymore. <laughs> I don't think that would work. These fucking, would guys, just make it worse. these fucking guys wouldn't be missing a thing. Uh, everybody's chugging the Coke now on these, this team. Yeah. Mm. I was about to say everybody's doing Coke, but (laughs) they're all drinking Coke. Uh, (laughs) They've got a serious Coke problem in the Toronto (laughs) fucking house. Jesus Christ. (laughs) All right, well, let's... Put that on TikTok. (laughs) uh, I want to move on to talking about the APAC teams here. We've already talked about the Hangzhou Spark. Who were some other teams that we wanted to to touch on? What was the... Fusion. Fusion. Uh, Fusion. Philadelphia Fusion. Fusion, yes, because Jonathan specifically, when we began our talks about the Philadelphia Fusion, said that he believed there would be a honeymoon phase with Hopper and Toby joining. And we said, well, no, why would there be a honeymoon phase? Why would they be happy to play with these players? Because they're missing out on playing with their full roster. That doesn't make sense. But Jonathan's theory does actually seem to have had some serious merit because I think that during the May Melee, they clearly crushed their opposition Went four and zero that nobody was expecting, not even themselves. Okay, they miss out on being able to actually make the main melee by a fraction against the team that ends up making it to the fri- finals. So I don't think you be, can be too mad about that. And then it hasn't looked the same for their game so far. Uh, what what would you say have been the big differences for the Philadelphia Fusion? Oof. Did you review both of the matches? I the the Chengdu Philly one is one the them. only one I haven't watched. Which one? Sorry, Chengdu Philly is the only one I haven't watched. I watched a New York one. Yeah, I watched a New York tragic. one. I didn't watch a Chengdu one. Because I mean, the meta changed up a lot of things for this team. But I think the big takeaway is that Rascals Echo and he with Mono and Hotbine engaging and disengaging. It's not good. There's some feeding going on in this team now. They 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 don't seem to understand the meta. Like, like in May Melee, it was way more about just playing like Brigana, play compact, play around Carpe, and that way you get value. Mono likes playing that way. Hotpa likes playing that way. Rascals but in this May echo, as well. Yeah, but in this meta, it's way more like back and forth. Sometimes you dive. Sometimes you peel with an echo. Uh, way more emphasis on your echo, and they just don't seem to nail this play style and this meta that well. Do you I... think we would see EQO? Well, EQO's only just got to Korea. EQO uh, only when did just he actually arrived. get there? E, uh, Very short. Rostan tweeted, I think, yesterday yeah. saying, and they're in the I've just arrived, we're in quarantine for a while. Okay, I, so... Maybe they'll be able to play next week, but I don't know that for sure. You'd have to check on Two like, weeks puts you at the... Two weeks would put you at like the knockout week. No, actually, yeah, two weeks. Yeah, two weeks would put you. Yeah, I mean, essentially, you like... could argue they're already at the knockout week almost by yeah. losing both these matches early. Yeah. yeah. Well, to me, when I was watching the game, now, granted, I didn't watch this game, so things may have changed pretty significantly. But when yeah, I watched here. Rascal play against New York, I felt like Rascal was, even though he innovated a lot when Echo was first released. He does not look on the same level as the top echoes anymore. Yep. Like try shots missing all over the place, sticky bombs wasted, going aggressively onto targets at the wrong time to put himself in exposed positions to just get tapped out the air by Flora. It was like a, a range, a multitude of errors and not high enough mechanics to be able to make up for that. And that surprised me because I was expecting Rascal's Echo to be pretty decent. Okay, Rascal normally picks up heroes really fast and then he kind of isn't able to stay at the top top as everyone else catches up to him but this was a it seemed like in that game against new york at least to be a fairly significant problem for the philadelphia fusion that they didn't have that just carry echo player that was gonna make big huge plays for them at the right time i mean this is a team that's supposed to have like shockwave right i mean shockwave eqo like uh yeah it's rough i mean i don't think there's a way to solve I mean, they don't have any other DPS there, right? So it's he's going to have to play it. And if they're bad at it, this just might not be the tournament for them, right? Uh, yeah. It's, it's extremely no tournament hard. No like... the tournament for them, Matt. They've never had a tournament that was the tournament for them. Well, they got close. Yeah, they got yeah. close. Yeah. They got close for them. They That's why I love having a lot of tournaments for them. But they, they've never been able to get over the line. But I feel like, though... 
in, in an odd way, I feel like this team almost accomplished their job with the way they played during the May Melee. Like, pretty much just not blowing the first, like, four games and ruining the season for when the rest of the other players are eligible. Are they but gonna, they're uh, not going to be there. <laughs> but who knows no. when they're even eligible, right? But I mean, what, they're playing as Fusion Uni in... In contemporary that implies style. to me that they're not ever going to be eligible yeah, because I otherwise agree. you wouldn't invest in creating you wouldn't the bring university back team academy no. to go just for the purpose of like oh it's a temporary thing you know I mean it might yeah. be a temporary thing T1 does it have might. fuck you money like but, if Comcast has but, fuck but you the thing money. is is like temporary to me even if it's like for like to me temporary implies like less than a whole year but like even if it's like two stages like but what do they the invest seasons? actually having those players playing contenders. What's I? Like they already have those players under contract. Like they may as well make them play anyway. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, I mean, they don't they really have, have to brand. invest any it's extra like, money. It's not it. like they're oh. spending a ton extra to do it. It's not a ton extra, but they do have to get the other contenders players on a contract and have like people to look yeah. after that. Yeah, but I'm sure it's and, minuscule but, in the green. Yeah, and so it it could be feasible that they would get back in at some point during well, the season, but it's not going to be anytime soon. If they're no, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm installing this I'm infrastructure. It's probably also, more of an investment to make sure when those players do get there, they're not, you know, once out of playing at a high level competitively yeah. and trying to get back to that level. Yeah. Like, this at least kind of keeps them in the flow of competition by playing in contenders. Like, not the same, obviously, level as Overwatch League, but still gets yeah. them in games if they can't scrim or whatnot. I mean, there's no point for them to scrim with the team right now. I mean, they, they can't play. No. So... I feel like, obviously, this is a topic and storyline that needs to be talked about. But if we go back to the June Joust, unless anyone had anyone, anything else to add on Fusion University? And... I had... No, not on Fusion Uni, no. Oh, okay. Are we so, I mean... Yeah, I mean, I don't really have... Do you have anything to I'm add? more just wondering, like, also, what's the timelines for contenders again? Are they still doing, like... um, Like, they're just still, they still have, like, seasons of contenders, right? So, like, that adds a whole... Like... Because also, if it's not a long-term thing, couldn't, like, would that, would contenders be it's fine if, like, a Fusion University was like, hey, by the way, you can go to Korea, like, right now. I think they would just go. They would just go, right? I they would just, they would, would yeah. they just forfeit that whole season? I think so, yeah. I, I'm well, sure no, they, they, probably they just, wouldn't care, they just but... Other contenders players to just jump on the team? Like, maybe, I have no idea how maybe. that works. I mean, but, but yeah. the I think thing it, is, I don't know exactly I think it lasts for two months. Works. June yeah. and July, I think it lasts for two months. Yeah. So they could just replace those players. I don't know. Pick up some random open division talent. But, but once again, the like, whole point being is like that's still like a lot of moving parts for something that if you think it's temporary, it's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. Jonathan, yeah, what and was it's your a point? shorter season too. Um, no, for the June Joust. I mean, I we're being we're talking about Fusion University and that storyline stuff, but we're being you know a bit doomer here about <laughs> the Philadelphia Fusion because they lost two games. But I mean, I still feel like they could fix this. I feel like Philadelphia Fusion. They did become a victim a little bit of week one and hero pools. Like, you just go in, you practice for a week in hero pools, and it didn't click. I still feel like Rascal could work up his mechanics a little bit. I feel like Mon and Hotba could play better alongside of him. Maybe, like, Toby plays some better Mercy, juggling between, like, Carpe, Rascal, and Tanks, etc. So, I still feel like this team can rapidly improve. I also feel like they could be one of the teams who makes the adoption to double shield early. Um, in case cool. they wanted to do that. So that is always an option. And their next two remaining matches, if they're shooting for the knockouts, are Guangzhou Charge and the Los Angeles Valiant. So oh, there, you go. there is... Two. There is... No. No. Here's the thing, Matt. Guangzhou Charge, based on this past weekend's matches, hmm. looks like a top three APAC team. The way they play Echo Mercy and the way they take fights. They beat the New York Excelsior in almost like a straight-up kind of... Um, Winston, um, Echo, Mercy. I love the way they took fights. They were the uh, choice of one looked like a fucking beast on Echo. Um, they were good. diversified. They nono their Winston at times, and Rio went in. Krong looked really solid. They would nono choice of one, and he would let get value. They could peel. They could go aggressive. Kariv hit bionates that were unreal. Um, they beat the New York Excelsior very just like straight up. They were the better team, had better engagements. Um, and that was the New York, by the way, that beat the Philadelphia Fusion. The other yeah. match they lost was against the Hangzhou. Was it Hangzhou? Yes, uh, it was. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, wasn't it? I thought it was the Joes battle. No, they Joes lost. Uh, battle. Yeah, they oh, lost against the Hangzhou Spark. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think Hangzhou Spark is like the best team in APAC with the, the composition they're currently playing and how good Shai is. So this is actually like 
we're in main melee we looked at this and we were like okay this is like the fourth and fifth team in APAC these might actually be like the number one and number three team in APAC based on the matches this past week so um I would not you know count out a win for the fusion against the Wankel Charge they look really good um if if the meta stays the same and people keep playing Winston Mercy Echo yeah. stuff and you might say that the Philadelphia Fusion's chances rely on getting that double shield down early, but you don't have Mano and play Orissa. That just doesn't make sense to me. So I don't think that's a direction that the team is going to path in either. Yeah. Um, what, is, what is our next topic? Do we have any other APAC teams to talk about, or are we moving on to matches for next week? The, the thing was, I was writing topics for this, and all the teams, like, they beat themselves. So I wrote Clown Fiesta, because, like, Shanghai uh, yeah. Dragons, I mean, they I won literally, one, it one. is tragedy Felser. out there. <laughs> it is it's, a tragedy out there for the Pickums right now. Yeah. Not not gonna lie, I I was I was like a crumb. Just a, I got just nine crumb fucking pickums. points the first. I have week. ten. I got so. zero because I forgot to do any at the beginning of the week. So you know it's better for better for you. Yeah, I did that for May Melee. Forgot to do it for the. Play I got the four. Play. I forgot to do it for the playoffs Step as well. Up, I've just well. boomed myself the entire season because I forget to put them in the website. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Did you have anything else to say about these teams? Shanghai Dragons, they're trying to play Lip Soldier a lot, and it's, some, it's very hit and miss, and I'm like, to, okay. <laughs> to me, I honestly don't have that many thoughts on just the entirety of the June Joust until the meta stabilizes a bit more. Yeah. Like, I feel like we need another, at least another week for teams to figure out what's good and start boiling things down, especially in the APAC region, things seem very up in the air, but even, even considering the NA region as well, you had teams playing Double Shield, teams playing Orisa Diva, you had teams playing Ball, teams playing Hog. Well, a tiny bit of hog. You had teams playing the like the Moira Lucio comps as well. It feels like people are still trying to figure out what works into what. It's there's no there's no coherent logic that strings between teams of like this is a good map for this. This is how you counter this with the rock paper scissors stuff going on. It still feels like it's a week out from being solved a bit more. Like the the yeah. main melee meta. Well, that meta was, was also active developed for all of preseason scrims. Exactly. Yeah, they had a whole off season to yeah. develop that, right? Yeah. So that's the thing. Uh, that's my personal opinion is that it's a clown fiesta because we literally the hero pool we just don't know. Yeah. Right. And also is this, this hero pool was. I, I think it was a fine. I think it's fine. It's just a, it's it's fun to see new mm -hmm. heroes. It's not what I enjoy watching when I watch Overwatch because I I feel like I'm watching teams experimenting rather than having answers but that's just me but also that would have that's happened subjective. regardless right like if we even without hero pools let's say theoretically we had a meta change and from the net from one stage to the next that yeah, would happen that would right? always happen it's just yeah, it's kind of just it happens it's any meta change there's no there's no way like yeah. it just becomes a, a for sure like certainty with hero pools shall we shall we participate in the clown fiesta i would love to participate in the clown fiesta what do you mean is that what comes up next our pickums yeah because nice. goddamn, I I am ready. I want. Okay, here's hopefully the I got my the right ones. Yeah, what are the matches, uh, I... Josh? All right, I'll I do don't it. Know. The first match is the shock against the defiant. Okay. Anyone take the defiant? Yeah. No. So no. The, no. <laughs> it was very hard to decide on the fifth match in our top five matches, and this, this became the, the fifth. fifth this was the fifth match. <laughs> Do you Sato's gonna need to drink a lot of fucking two liters before this one starts. <laughs> I want to talk generally, though, just for a moment. San Francisco Shock have looked extremely mortal so far this season. Is this gonna happen again? Like, are we... The, this team is not an undefeatable giant that is just gonna be excellent at every meta. From what we've seen them pl see being played so far, is the Shock gonna be one of our, like, top untouchable... T oh, not untouchable, but, like, top absolute elite tier teams? I... I don't think they'll be like as untouchable as they have been in the past. I think this is definitely a team that that has like some more holds like this year. And I and I wonder as well, like we see, you know, I think some of the pressure of being on the shock, maybe getting to some of the players. Uh, I know I think like uh, FD God, I thought he's played well, but he seems like super critical of his play. Like we don't know, like you know, Nero Glister, we haven't really seen that much from. We just don't know how they somewhat. incorporate yeah. all these new players. Uh, yeah. I also wonder, like, who, like, who plays Echo for this team? I guess like Nero. Will? Be Nero I, I mean, think. Glister could. He's a hyperflex. No, he won't because they won't. They play won't play him. him. Yeah, they, <laughs> they won't play him. him so. I mean, I don't know. They could theoretically uh, hell if they were feeling of interest, they could bring out Tayo even. They're feeling really Tayo? Yeah. yeah, I mean, who knows? Yeah. They could uh, Violet. 
They could play Violet. Yeah, haven't Violet played Echo? Hasn't he done it? Yes, he yeah, did it on Volsky, Violet, yeah. right? And I don't want them to do it again. Thank you very much. But yeah, to me, I mean, I just don't have a good feel for how good Nero is going to be compared to the best Echoes in the world. I mm. think he's probably going to be good, but I don't know whether he's going to come out and just dominate on it in the same way that like a Pelican or a Dante or somebody does. Oh, so yeah. I don't actually think that Shock are going to be untouchable. I mean, the story of the Shock is just figuring out what the hell are they doing with the roster? It's sure. literally like, when does the crusty crack pipe end <laughs> and the crusty enlightenment path begin? Right, right. Like, that's actually like, because to He's me... He's taking his ayahuasca trip right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, legitimately, that is... But the, to me, that's actually kind of a big deal for them is like, what are they doing to the roster still? Mm. And because like, they're they're playing Violet on DPS multiple yeah. times. They're stuck between this main tank rotation that is suboptimal because it only works out because you have players that are so talented and like the best right heart in the world, the super, right? So like... Mm. There's a lot of, and I don't want to hear any God, Houston fans mauled me out of existence. Like, well, Jongu looked pretty good when he played against Super. It's like, well, okay, but Super literally dominated for like years on this. So like, yeah. calm down. Like, Super's won the Overwatch League. So twice. Yeah. And so the point being is that like, this roster doesn't make sense. And the Glister conundrum, it is the puzzle piece. I straight up believe that the Glister, Glister is the, the Philosopher's answer. Stone. <laughs> For, for San Francisco Shock. I think okay. it is. I think I, I, it doesn't make any sense what's happening with Glister. It literally makes no sense how Glister is not getting played for this team. Yeah. It, it fixes so many of their issues. It's, it's going to be one of those Erster issues where it just, we never know. I'm going to lose yeah, my who do you think freaking uh, mind, dude. What do you think they'll come out and run with on DPS? Like with no, Dante Striker. No Tracer. Oh, sorry. Nero Dante Striker. Striker huh? Nero Dante Striker. Striker. I think they'll, pretty play, good, I think. think they'll just play Nero Striker. You don't think we yeah. see Glister? I. I mean, I'd what like happens to, if they put but Violet I don't Echo. think so. Not from what they've played so far. If they play Violet Echo, if they play I'm Violet out. on DPS and they play Twilight on support. What if they put like Striker Johnny? on Echo? I'm they out. put Violet on Korea or something. I'm out. I'm out. All right, I mean, what's the next match? It is a big oh, play style shift between the uh, last meta and the main melee where like your hit scan just need to be like, just press W and just walk forward and shoot people. Now you can actually kind of like sit back and act as a bait, though your Echo can peel as well. Violet will I think. It. I think that the shock will be fine. I think that this hero pool and a change of meta is, is like it's like um, it's like a turning of a page. It's okay. like a get out of jail free card when it comes to the mental boom because you're just like okay, maybe it's in the past. We can go into the June joust now. It's a new hero pool. We know we've been great playing double shield in the past, or if they play like you know Shoyobin Diva and they play uh, Smurf for Risa, they're gonna figure it out. They have I fantastic judge. players on this team. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna be a turning of a page. I think it'll be fine. Okay. What if they just start to try and play like the spark and they put striker on the reaper and you have fucking violet for the long range hit scan and you bring in the twilight on just play glister bro just play pass me the crack poo. pipe map <laughs> pass me the crack pipe so there you go pass me the crack pipe thank you thank you it wouldn't work in na like i'd straight up predict against the san francisco shock if they started rolling out with that comp Please don't. Okay. Just play what, double shield. What is the or, next uh, match? Or is the what is it? it it's oh, the Atlanta Reigns team against the Gladiators. Ooh. Ooh. We've got a glance pick here. I don't think this is unreasonable. You, I just don't have You just don't have data. I just yeah, I just don't have any you reason data. to do Could it. Could I uh, for the audio listeners of Ast oh, yeah. picked Gladiators and everything. I have picked pick. Gladiators audio listeners. Um That's and the reason I've done really so. loud right now. <laughs> All right. There you go. I wanted to get closer to the microphone. The reason I've done so is mostly because we don't have any data on them. So I'm like, screw it. Then the gladiators. Uh, <laughs> but but legitimately, okay. actually, from from a more realistic pr perspective, I think if this team continues to play bird ring, they should ascend back to like a top four in a status. Okay. Is my personal belief. I think gladiators, if they just play bird ring, I think they're going to be better than Atlanta. I think their tank line is now. I do have some question marks a bit over space because I personally thought he underperformed in yeah. May Melee. Um, but I think this meta we're moving into is something that space understands really well because this meta for D.Va is like you are zoning Echo, you're marking Echo, and you're like doing some very traditional D.Va things. And that's something that space has been doing for a long time in his career to a lot of success. Sure. Um, so I have a lot of faith for them for this meta. I think Muse is going to be fine for his hero pool. I think if they play Bird Ring, Bird Ring's hit scan is cracked out, and they have I, Mirror can play Echo. 
Mirror could play oh, Echo. you'd want Mirror in on Echo, not Kev. Instead I of mean, Kev you could play either one. You could play Kev or Mirror. Like, they have options, right? Like, obviously, okay. I haven't... I can't remember. Have we seen Kevster's Echo before? E I just can't remember it. I'm almost I, certain we have, but... I thought he I, played it last now year. you're making me doubt it. I, I thought he Mirror I, I legitimately just can't remember. Um, and then they have, like, Moth. Moth got very good mercy. Very yeah, solid Brigida. Yeah. Moth's a yeah. perfectly flexible. And then, you know, overall, they have Shu. Shu's going to be able to play whatever. Yeah. So, I, I think this team... And they showed signs of life once they stabilized the roster and played Bird Ring. Yeah. into my melee um i just have more belief in this roster overall currently than i do atlanta sure. like if it, I'm, I'm not mad i, I mean, think i think if atlanta wi i think if atlanta wins this match it's because pelican just pounds i think it's just because pelican's gonna pound sure. out of control if they win this match. i i think you while my mirror played some of the echo last year i think this meta suits kevster's play style better Sure. You need that's fine. you need a you need a flex DPS with raw fuck power. And I feel <laughs> yeah. like Kevster is yeah. that for the Los Angeles. That's why I literally just don't remember Kevster's echo, so that's why I didn't include it. But like, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't either. Like, I'm just thinking about like how he plays the other heroes. And mm -hmm. I, as an echo, like if you can get like two kills and just like you go in with your focusing beam and just laser people, and then you turn into a diva built a. But is Kevster is drop, Kevster you know? a vocal player? I don't I know. Have no idea. He's because Swedish, right now, not. personally, I think your echo has to be really to get max value, especially if you play dive comps at all. Your mm -hmm. echo has to be extremely coordinated. Like when you watched how like Paris Eternal played, yeah. when you watch how all the teams that played really well, they had extremely good synergy generally between their echo and their tanks. Um, yeah. And they also, you also, it's not just the tanks. You have to let your mercy know. You can't just like go yeah, and your mercy yeah. can't catch up. You have to let your mercy know. It's like, hey, I'm going in. Like, follow me. Yeah. So that's what I'm. Okay, what's the next match of this week, huh? What we got? It's Ooh. these teams. The Dallas Fuel against the San Francisco Shock. And again, <laughs> Avast is alone with the Dallas Fuel here. Explain to me why you think Fuel should be bad, first of all. Yeah, I'm not... Uh, I mean, we have no data on either of these two but, teams. But that's what I'm trying to figure out. Why would you think Fuel would be bad at this? The biggest I, reason that I'm breaking not... news. Oh, yeah? We have a player signing for the Shanghai Dragons. Okay. Oh, who is it? Who are you? What? I mean, okay. We'll, we'll Let's do just do this. We'll do, we'll do that wait, in a second. Just what? wait. <laughs> I mean, I need some time to process just that. Goddamn, what wait. is that? Just okay. hold the fucking phone. Here's the reason that I'm... Okay, I'm not... I don't think that San Francisco Shock are going to be unbelievable in this meta, but... I have big questions about what Dallas are going to do when it comes to that long-range hitscan role. What if they because, don't play it? Well, what's sorry? What if they just play Reaper? I they thought play I was Reaper fucking Echo. kidding. <laughs> you were molding at the Reaper Echo comps. I don't no, think no, they're no, viable but, but, but the thing is, I mean, like, they could. I think if there's one team to make it work and make me not hate it, it's Dallas Fuel. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, Dallas were excellent in the May Melee. I just yeah. don't know how it's going to translate over. I think that... I think we've been watching Winston's just get kind of fisted recently. We've been watching Long Range Hitscan be really powerful and Dallas Fuel would rather play Winston comps with no long range hit scan, and even the person that was being able to flex over to that was Sparkle, who is going to be playing. Actually, that's he could not play true. Legs. He could play he legs. He could play the legs. He could play legs. I was thinking about Sparkle playing the Echo 100, but Doha yeah. is actually in the player that's been picking. Oh, and, and Doha's Echo is really good it, it is too. Good, actually, Doha's yeah. Echo is excellent. Their tank line yeah, so they could flexible. just play. Their support line's good. They could just play Echo Soldier the whole time. I I, yeah. I, yeah. I just don't see a reason why people will be bad. No, no, that's I can't. A good I can't point, make an argument. I can't make an argument as to how people could lose. Right now, so, uh, I mean, okay, if, I agree with you. If this trend towards Arisa comps, though, yeah, that, that's cool. what I'm thinking. It's like a default L, you know. I, I'm true. sorry, but Sparkle Soldier is not going to do a shit ton if the Shock decide to play Orisa Diva or Orisa Sigma. Like, I'm, I'm, that's not how it works. Okay, if you bet on the Dallas Fuel here, and all the Dallas Fuel fanboys will be in my Twitter replies and be like, "You didn't have faith in the Doha Doha Echo." That's literally all you're hedging your bet on. It's Doha Echo is going to pound and destroy the San Francisco Shock. Because I don't think Fearless will have the same impact yet in the main melee. Maybe. I could actually see this team come out with double shield themselves. But then it's still like, what, what do you put Sparkle on to like really make him shine? Double shield with Echo and Solier? There's some stuff to figure out. I feel like Shock is a safer bet there. Haven't we seen Hanzo too? From, from Doha. No, yeah. but Apex I mean, I'm saying Hanzo. Hanzo is also in their pool. Yeah. They could play like Sparkle, Echo, Doha, Hanzo. Yeah, yeah they could play Like that. the thing yeah. is, I just think their hero pool is good. I think the purple's good. Aside from yeah. Fearless's Orisa, that is my one concern for this team is Fearless's Orisa. Which could be a which could be a big concern. Big concern. That's yeah. my one concern. Yeah. But I think I think if there's one team that could make it work, it's Fuel. Okay. Right now. I think they could. Matt, for Matt, sure. uh, what 
You're, you're like you're, you're, you're bouncing look with look excitement just, because of the just juice. Just fucking out of nowhere, <laughs> like uh, literally, this is just out of left field. There's yeah. Uh, so uh, we are very honored to have announce. We, uh, that wait, 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 have we got another match? We have uh, two, more matches, we two, we more two more matches. Two more matches. Yeah, shut up, Matt. We need to get through the okay, matches. So let's shut do up. the matches. Uh, New York Soul. <laughs> you, you, you dumbass. <laughs> NYXL Soul Dynasty. Oh. Yo. Okay. Well, I went for the Soul Dynasty along with Jonathan Reinforced Larson, and we've got New Yorkers here with the actual New Yorker and then a Vast. I feel like Apex a bit of a crapshoot here. Did I uh, predict this? <laughs> Okay. Are you having a me <laughs> moment? I don't know this, but that's fine. I'll defend New, it. New York did look okay in their game, but and we haven't seen Soul play. I feel like this is a good meta for Soul, though. If I think of a meta where gesture and profit should be able to get value, it's this meta. If you can, if they want to opt into playing Arisa comps, even if they don't, where they're going to be syncing up together, I, I feel like I have, I have decent confidence in the. The gesture main tank in this meta. And profit can fuck. Yes. I kind of view New profit York as... Uh, New York is kind of where we had a lot of hope with them going into the season. They were shit in the main melee. I think this is kind of them coming to that moment where they're they're kind of hit. And I just never trust Soul Dynasty. I mean, it, 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 you talk about the crusty crack pipe. I mean... You don't know how much those people have been drinking over there. It depends. Some days they look amazing. Then the next day, you know, it's just all over the place. Uh, I, I don't trust it. I, okay. I just never trust it. I, oh. I think the soul are going to have a wonky That's ass cool. week. Okay. I, I agree with Josh that if they decide to play like some Risa comp, I think they're actually going to re do really well. And the maps for this one, I can sort of probably say it. It's Junkertown oh. and Hanamura. And I feel right. like Soul is favored on those maps. Because New York Excelsior, they're poor at adapting. They just play their like Winston Diva composition and they just play with Feather Echo and Flora Hitscan. And that's all they do. Well, I think the Soul Dynasty, they might actually play the, to the strengths of those maps better. Um, and so I think that suits the Soul Dynasty. Um, so yeah, what, what is the last match? Uh, the last match is... Da -da 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 -da. The Soul so Dynasty was... against the Shanghai Dragons. And again, <laughs> Avast is out on a little island predicting the opposite team. Um, Avast has gone with the Soul Dynasty. The rest of us have gone Man. with the Shanghai Dragons. You went against Soul with well, that's New the thing. York. I literally don't remember making that prediction. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm sure I told it to Kurt. I don't think Kurt did anything wrong. It's just I feel like I'm zooted right now. <laughs> uh, so I don't remember making that pred. So that's that's on me. Okay, so why do you think Soul is good then? Uh, with what? everything you said. Oh. I think I, okay, I, cool. I think I actually think this is a chaos meta currently. They don't know what's happening. If there's one thing Soul could do, it's thrive on chaos. I think Soul... Sure. This team is inherently dysfunctional. I don't believe in them long term. And but I think if there's any sort of random apocalyptic scenario with the meta, I think Soul is gonna. You know those little bottom feeder fish that suck up everything and they come up and they they're like, <laughs> and it's Soul. That's Soul with any sort of fucking meta. That's different. Like okay. Soul, anything where Gesture can just ball out of control. Yeah. Is that's where that's where they're gonna pop off. And this is it. This is the one. Yeah, it definitely feels like that. I, I've got faith in Shanghai to figure stuff out. I think they're normally a pretty good team at like, getting a grip on uh, what's going on. I will say, though, they, I, I don't know. This matter to me, even though it's not similar in a lot of different ways, gives me slight vibes of like the Summer Showdown in that instead of hard-pocketing the Genji, you're like putting a lot of resources into DPS Echo. And, and in that sense, like requiring that person to just bop for your team, yeah. I think is something that Shanghai have historically struggled with a little bit. They like the, they like everybody to be sharing the, the load uh, between everybody on the team. And like their tanks, are, they put a lot of resources into their tanks to create space. I think if they were to play this match a week from, like next week, like not this upcoming week, but two weeks from now essentially, I think Shanghai would win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it could just be a factor of time. Yeah. Well, now that Shanghai yeah. have Who Are You, they can play him in this Yeah, well, let's, let's get on to this okay, shit. I'm going to get some water. Before so, what the fuck is, are you talking about, Matthew? What, so it what just popped up on my Twitter timeline. It says, it's time to cut through the competition. Welcome Who Are You uh, to the Shanghai Dragons. So and they then dropped Ursta, a... uh, or Ursta retired, and they picked it up It seems like they you? opened up a roster spot for Who Are You. So there's a, a paragraph. We are very honored to announce that DPS player Who Are You has officially become a member of the Shanghai Dragons. 
He will be showcasing his talent as an important part of the Dragons on our upcoming journey and battle for victory. As one of the most talented young players, who are you has always amazed us with his play. Now he chooses to continue his legacy and return to Overwatch League. We are beyond excited and look forward to his return. As who are you? I don't know what to say. Okay, so the, the first thing that I get from this is that the coaches really want a heavy carry flex DPS player on the team. Like a, a Chad player. flex DPS player. A bit like Ursta. Like, who are you is somebody that you commit all your resources to and just hope that he carries team fights because he's not going to play like the slow, um, strategic, disciplined style. That isn't him. He, he, he goes in there and tries to carry. But who are you hasn't actually done it on the Overwatch League stage, has he? Am I forgetting some important piece of history here? Did it, was who are you good at any point? Uh, he was on uh, he was on NYXL, right? For a yeah, bit. And I mean, at good? one point, who are you was like literally dominating in a contenders. Like, yeah, but that's just contenders. Also, also, he was doing well. Yeah, in Apex, like it, that's. But I feel like that's the last time who are you has been relevant. Yeah, I mean, in, they didn't he really played play for him on... in New York, but I swear he wasn't good. Am I just misremembering? They just uh, Hacksaw was good on that team. I don't think they played him a ton. No, not really. I not don't from... think highly of who are you. I, but I, I don't know. I, I honestly wait. When was he? Even... I don't. Don't talk to me about who are you. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Leave me all out right. of it. Put some rabbit play on here. I don't know what uh, to say. One second. I'm just checking. Some something very important to me is I'm figuring out if his has he ever been on a team with Moon. No, I don't. I, I don't, don't think he has. So, right? No. no. Um, but Moon must have picked him up directly here. Like this makes this is a Moon, a Moon pickup. Really? I feel is like this is Moon him? buying into the stonks of Who Are You. Damn. But yeah, what the Mother Deck. How does he fit Yeah, he hasn't. Like, he hasn't. He hasn't worked with Moon. So like that. That was going to be my hypothesis. Is that Moon to work with him before? That's literally if Moon makes like, a pickup. If he'd worked with him before, he'll make a pickup. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, on your point, Josh. Maybe I guess that's his role in this team. Is like fucking aggressive aggressive like flex dps echo like try and just get him in there and just pocket his ass but I he has to play, play with him this week they might play with him in this game yeah they might no, and also has he, he hasn't even been in contenders is the thing he hasn't even been in no, contenders. I mean, not recently, the way they it? worded it sounded like he's gonna play well uh, I could well, see him what, being played uh, in this meta right here, where you just give all your resources to the Echo and you, oh, I don't know. This could see. be a who are you meta, you, it could be. No, 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 okay, let me ask you this. Do you think there's any way he replaces Lip in some fashion, because Lip doesn't have the flexibility in this meta with Sombra and Tracer being removed? Because all Lip can do is essentially play, like, Soldier. No, he could play well, Reaper. Ash, he's an Ash. He could play Reaper too. Ash as well. Ash, true. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Lip could play that, a lot of these heroes. Bleep, bleep that out, Kurt. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, Hanzo um, is Hanzo just, is insane. Yeah. I mean, I think if any, I just think that's like, there's only one explanation for this, and it's like, we want, who are you? The biggest brain play. So here's something, actually, when, when we're talking, harken back to Justice a bit, but like, there was one point when they were playing like a dive comp for Justice, and they were doing something that was completely anti-synergy, mm. and if they had had Decay in, they could have played like, Genji Echo for the Fool's Dive thing. What if, what if, now this is like a straight up, like I'm off the goop okay. with this one. All right. But Some what teams if they actually did that in APAC? Yeah. They were what, but what goop. if they committed to an Echo Genji Dive and they had Who Are You Play Genji? His one, his, his one trick. I've asked. What if they did it? If I told you that Philadelphia Fusion played Carpe on Genji. No, no, seriously. I saw it. I saw it with my own two eyes. It was burned like in Indiana Jones and they opened up the arc. The electric lightning just burned me all the way through. So I oh, think I it's possible. I think it's possible. I think imagine they play Who Are You Genji with the Echo or something like that. Sure. Because that makes the more sense to me than coming bringing them in to play Echo. Yeah. That it's straight up not does. a good comp though, I've asked. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter it's... if it's a good comp. It doesn't matter if it's a good comp. You have Who Are You. You have to play what Who Are You plays because that's Who Are You. Yeah. Uh, Flutter's Echo is good. I mean, it's not like... It's not like he needs to be replaced on that role, I don't think. I, I, I swear to God, they're going to have Who Are You play Genji if they bring him in. I mean, that is just nuts. What a ridiculous signing. This confuses me even more. The, the, I was talking about what a weird career Ursta had. What, what weird signings these whole situations are. Absurd. Any, any further comments, be, Mr. Morello? It, oh, sorry. It, it would be crazy if it's... Like, did you say this, that, like, Who Are You could be a more aggressive Echo over Flatter? Yeah. Like, yeah. Summer Showdown? 
Was that you, Matt? Uh, well, me. no, I mean, Josh, Josh, mentioned, Josh mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. I said he could. He, yeah, I mean, could he replace, like. I Has he played Echo in an a... organized environment? I don't know. In the past year and a half. I, I to two know. years. What I saw, I saw something today. I haven't read it. I'm trying to find it. Where like Haxall was back playing like pugs in Lord Korea. Almighty. God, if Haxall comes back, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose it. I oh, dude, it oh, way, way more than way more than who are you? I would love that Haxall back. Um, okay, we have been going I, so long right now. We've we've got to we've got to wrap this episode up and grab it by the horns. It's uh. I believe it is time for our favorite It is segment. time for Overwatch turns five years old favorite memories. Okay, we can do it quickly. Just I do mean, it quick. I added this top to How long is our episode? Bro, our episode has been going for a thousand <laughs> years, Matthew. We've, we've got to skip that. We can return to it next week. Oh, my favorite memory is when Shanghai signed Who Are You? Really? Johnny, yeah, right? <laughs> That's my favorite memory. It is time for Bren's Player of the Week, presented by T-Mobile. I need to piss too, Josh. Yay! Okay. Yay! The Brent's Player of the Week presented by T-Mobile this week. I'm going to go for an out there pick that you're all going to mold about, I'm sure. No. I am going for Unter. Not a player, a coach for the Atlanta Reign who moved from the Los Angeles Valiant over to the Atlanta Reign. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to spin you this narrative arc and see if I loop you in here. Massa's interview recently, it was interesting to me. I think after the game where they played against Houston or something, and he was talking about the fact that they had changed up a lot of their practice recently, where they had shifted away from just doing heavy practice to doing way more VOD review and individual review and talking through stuff as a team together. And I'm sure there were other changes that they've implemented as well. Now, my theory, and again, this is a Brent's player of the week that I'm loaning out on credit here. If it, if it ends up not being true, I'm going to yank it back off him. But my theory is that Unter, having worked under the LA Valiant system and having essentially taken over from like Gumba when those guys moved over to Valorant, they kind of inherited that set, that setup that Packington and Gumba had been doing, where it was a lot of player driven VOD review that had been really good for the LA Valiant. And I think porting that system, or at least kind of pulling them in that direction would be really important for Atlanta to do stuff like get a lot better in the June joust and make these kind of sizable improvements. So the narrative arc that I'm spinning right now is that the addition of these coaches is actually starting to solve some of the core issues with the Atlanta Reign, which were the fact that they looked really poor in terms of their team play and their coaching wasn't able to have a big impact. So I'm selling that narrative. And if it's untrue, I'm going to be slightly pissed because I think it's quite a cool narrative that I, I kind of believe that it could be, it could be very legitimate. I, I have no information to fight that, so I guess yeah. I have to agree I mean, it has it. as much backing as any other Brins player of the week, <laughs> so yeah. I'm yeah. fine with And it. fuck it, if Anta hasn't done that, then we'll give it to the Gloucester Rugby Club, so whatever. That's fine. Yeah. We love Gloucester. We love Gloucester. And that is our episode. I mean, that's got to be the longest episode we've ever done because of I the I feel like every time the four of us get together, it's a really long episode. That must be because when you replace me with Jaws, there's two people on the show who don't say anything. So Johnny and Jaws just sit on the outside and then you two just chat on the inside. But now that I'm here, I'm actually, I can't wait for COVID to be over so I can fight this little dwarf. Fucking <laughs> hell. <laughs> Johnny, you can't wait for COVID to be over so I can fight this little dwarf. Fucking hell. You, you've been Maybe? silently lost in the source of who are you. I just saw you looking at your well, screen um, and smiling at yourself. Like, hey, 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 well, I mean, uh, uh, what, what other player could randomly, like, uh, I mean, think of another signing Pine, right now. Pine, and who are you? What the fuck is uh, this? That's true. We're back in 2018. It's absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Maybe the Titans will bring back Fisher. Hey, nice. hey, dude! If Fisher hey, bring Bumper uh, back, hey. Bumper's Bumper. the replacement. Bumper, Bumper's the, Bumper Bumper would be <laughs> Bumper the for back. Vancouver Titans. He's coming back to replace. I hope Bumper comes back and sinks that organization. Like he comes back and just ints every game. He charges off the map just for he revenge. He played off tank for Runaway Overwatch Two. He can play off tanks uh, and main yeah. tanks. Unbelievable! All right, well, we'll see you for episode eighty-nine. This was episode eighty-eight. Goodbye.